Okay, Tim, just to advise you, we're now in public session. Um, are members aware of any apologies? I, I've had one email from um, sort of Matthew O'Toole said it would be late, and Jim, you said you've had something from Jim Wells? Yes, somewhere. Some yes. Okay. And Gemma, do you say you're uh, delegating some authority to Malaysia at some stage during the meeting? Yeah, I just have a meeting at three. I um, hope to be back by four. Okay. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, declarations of interest. Our members are obliged to declare any relevant financial or other interests. Any interest to declare? Uh, moving on to item three, chairperson's business. Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, members are advised that I have been again invited by the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee to attend an informal meeting with other committee chairpersons on the Northern Ireland Protocol on the 27th of May 21. I have also been invited by the new House of Lords EU Affairs Committee to a meeting of its subcommittee on the Northern Ireland Protocol at a date to be confirmed. The committee had previously indicated that it was content for me to attend these meetings and report back accordingly. Are we still content for me to attend both meetings on behalf of the committee? Content. Great. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, reference the uh, permanent secretary. The clerk has circulated an email to members on the appointment of the next permanent secretary for the Department of Finance. A panel has been established. The external competition will launch in early June with panel interviews and psychometric testing in July and August. At the end of the process, NICSHR will seek the Minister's endorsement for the proposed candidate. Are members content to note the foregoing? Content. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. <clears throat> uh, next item on the agenda is the embargo PAC report. Members are advised that the clerk has circulated a copy of the Public Accounts Committee report on capability and capacity in the Northern Ireland Civil Service. The report is embargoed until midnight. Members are asked to refrain from comment until after this time. The committee has previously agreed to invite NIC, SHR and NIPSA to brief on the responses after the memorandum of, the memorandum of response had been formally considered by the PAC, which may be in September. Are we content to note the foregoing? Agreed. Draft minutes of the proceedings, the 12th of May, are at page 7. Are we content with this inaccurate reading of the proceedings, or if, we, if we're agreed, say agreed? Agreed. There are no matters arising. Uh, can we, uh, sorry, I remove the, uh, Stephen, do I remove the members from the spotlight? And then I add witnesses to the spotlight until the end of the briefing. Is that what we do? Okay. Uh, team, we're taking oral evidence now from the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, Fiscal Council uh, on the Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland. I'm welcoming on Starleaf. I'm uh, welcoming Sebastian Barnes, who's the chairperson of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council, and Dr. Eddie Casey, chief economist and head of secretariat as Irish Fiscal Advisory Council. Uh, the session is being recorded for Hansard. Clark's, the clerk's briefing note is at page 15. The IFAC evidence paper is at page 23. A non-technical summary of the IFAC of the December fiscal assessment reports is at page 28. And a summary of the IFAC long term sustainability report is at page 30. Uh, Sebastian, uh, who's, who's going to speak? Is it going to be you, Sebastian? Yes, it is. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian, first of all, apologies. I've just been to the dentist, so if I sound a bit slurred or burbled and the rest of it, it's not because I've been indulging in County Antrim's finest bushmills, but uh, <laughs> just in case you wonder why I'm sounding less loquacious than usual. And, and my questions might be briefer than usual as well. I can feel that's already beginning to happen with my tooth as well. Okay, please, Sebastian, over to you. Thank you. I have no excuse if uh, I'm unclear, so please. Um, anyway, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of the experience we've had on the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council. I'm the chairperson of the council, and I'm joined this afternoon by Dr. Eddie Casey, the council's chief economist and head of secretariat. The council was set up almost 10 years ago. Our mandate has four parts to assess and endorse the government's macroeconomic forecasts, to assess the budgetary projections, to assess compliance with the fiscal rules, and to assess the overall fiscal stance. We publish two main reports covering these issues each year, together with a wide range of contributions to the public debate and a report on long-term sustainability. The policy environment we face is very different from that of the powers devolved to the Assembly and the Executive Committee. Nonetheless, some of our experience is relevant. A recent in-depth review of the Council by the OECD found that the Council has, and I quote, helped strengthen fiscal management in Ireland. The OECD focused on two main achievements. First, the Council has helped to push the frontier of fiscal analysis, developing new analysis, methods, data and tools 
that help to provide better information to make decisions. Second, the Council's reports and outreach activities have improved the awareness of fiscal issues more generally in Ireland, the wider public, amongst policymakers and amongst stakeholders, including, of course, parliamentarians. These achievements rest on a clear mandate, the availability of adequate resources and staff, and the independence of our Council. The OECD principles here provide useful guidance, and it's encouraging that these are contributing to your thinking in Northern Ireland. Let me finish my opening statement by sharing two lessons that I personally would draw from our experience. First, it's very important to have a clear sense of what problems you expect the Council to help resolve. In the context of the Irish Republic, the risk of, of accentuating a boom-bust cycle volatile economy means that improving macro, economic and analysis and performance has been a key part of our work. At the same time, improving medium term planning and encouraging more public saving in good times is a central objective uh, for economic policy in Ireland and something to which we've contributed. By providing strong analysis and a voice for these longer term fiscal concerns, the Council is working towards this objective. The second lesson is that the effect is effectiveness of the Council depends critically on other people. On a day-to-day -day level, information from the government is essential to our work uh, and is absolutely critical uh, to what we do. But ultimately, the Council's advice is only effective if it is listened to. The media and politicians have generally been receptive to the Council's work, but the record on following the Council's advice is, to be honest, mixed. I hope this experience is helpful to us and we stand ready to answer your questions. Thank you. And, uh, sir, is uh, Eddie, are you going to say a couple of words? No, I, I think uh, the opening statement is just for Sebastian. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Um, just, I, I'm just going to start off with a couple of questions. Um, first one, I mean, bearing in mind um, when Ireland was under the Troika, it had to have its homework marked uh, twice a year. And did that sort of necessity of having that discipline process, did that help? in the work of the Council and when people realised that they had to present data in a way that was easily understood by the ECB and the IMF, did that help you or did you have to sort of um, encourage the sort of the other departments and the rest of it to actually pr get properly involved in that? That's the first question. So I think one way of looking at it, I think we're, we're in the world of two processes. There's the process by the European Commission, which was going on back in the Troika days in a very intensive way, but continues today. And then there's the council process. And I think those are, on the whole, mutually reinforcing as processes. Uh, and we saw that actually once the Troika um, uh, uh, monitoring was scaled down, we, you know, we saw that actually fiscal policy loosened up a little bit at that point. So it shows that having those two processes can be very complementary. But in the more recent period since that, um, uh, since that's happened, I think it's become more balanced. So initially with the Troika, and obviously the Troika has a lot of leverage because it decides whether to uh, disperse the loans, um, obviously that part of the, these two tracks is relatively important. I think as the Troika ended, we then switched back the other way. I think there are, on the whole, uh, the domestic Irish Fiscal Council view has generally been more stringent than the view of the European Commission. Which one is listened to more um, is, is a little bit a subject of debate, but I think having that external view is helpful. But I think having the domestic and the um, and the sort of external view together are very complementary. And I think one thing that we can the two things we bring as a fiscal council are partly that we have a much better understanding of what's going on in Ireland uh, than the, the Troika does, which is looking a little bit from the outside or, or the Commission. Uh, the other thing is I think we have a much bigger impact in the debate in Ireland. So I think the Troika, we know, in the Commission of view, the sort of outside bodies kind of imposing uh, uh, a, a kind of view. I think in our view, we can really engage with stakeholders. We can we, we talk in the media. We can have a presence that those other institutions just can't. Mm. Um, we've already heard of evidence, and particularly we were um, struck by the evidence we heard from the Scots, uh, I think it was last week, and about it was the issue of sort of the modelling they created was used across government because actually if we were all modelling to the same way it was easier to see trends and be able to sort of have that checks and balances and controls and detailed understanding particularly for the sort of the likes of the sort of um, uh, the legislators so they understood the process so you know do you are you using the same models that government use or is there 
a reluctance to use the sort of the similar sort of modelling, or do you think because of Ireland's scale in particular, and it is a larger economy than uh, it's definitely a larger economy in Northern Ireland, but you know a similar sort of scale to Scotland. Is there a, a degree of wanting to use the similar sort of modelling, or have you had to dumb that from, from scratch? So I think there's an element of both, and that's an excellent question. On the one hand, I think one of the reasons we're here is to create challenge. So we're careful of not using exactly the same assumptions as, finance, as the Department of Finance and coming to exactly the same results, because that would be pretty um, pointless. So, so we are careful about that. And for example, when we do our forecasts, we deliberately don't uh, look at what the Department of Finance has done so that we're really kept taking an independent look at it and hopefully not being caught up by groupthink. And I think part of the mandate of a council like ours, whose role is to assess the, someone else's projections, is to challenge and to look at them and say, well, what could be wrong, wrong with this? What do we think the weaknesses are? What, what bits could come unstuck? So Definitely that independence is important, but I think also, and, and you're right, in a small, in a, an economy that's not huge, with a huge number of economists looking at these things, uh, naturally, you know, people are going to tend to use the same models a bit. And I think, I don't know if this is a Scottish experience, but our experience is that a lot of the modelling work that we've done has really pushed the frontier in terms of the way the Irish economy is modelled. So, for example, a, a concept that is used a lot in fiscal policy is the notion of an output gap. That's the difference between what the economy is producing and what it could potentially produce. Is it, is, are we in a recession or, or booming? Uh, and basically, the council there has laid out a, a new approach because we thought it was important. We didn't think what was being done was very good. And that's now the approach that's used by the Department of of finance. There's a lot of modelling about the multinational sector, again, where we've really been pushing the boundaries uh, of what's done. So I think it's a little bit of a mixture of the two, but it does come from the fact that we don't slavishly follow the same models and we come from a somewhat critical perspective. And I think that's what you expect from a body like a council. Yeah. And so my final question, and it's, it's on this criticality, but it's the importance of independence. Uh, I know from uh, living and working in Dublin and in business circles for quite some, some period of time that you've managed to annoy a few government departments. So obviously you're doing the right thing at the right time. But how, what, how important is that degree of independence? And do you feel that you're sufficiently, um, uh, I'm going to try, I'm going to use the word very carefully here, that you're efficiently away from the golden sort of uh, the golden Dublin circle to be able to have that degree of independence? Yes, so, so I think our independence is one of our achievements. I think it's never been seriously questioned by anyone that we're independent. And that reflects a couple of things. I think the two big pillars there are the appointments process. So there's now a sort of uh, uh, official appointments process. But also there were very clear criteria in the legislation that people had to be, to be appointed to the council, um, people had to have relevant qualifications uh, and a strong background in these kinds of issues. Uh, there's also always been a strong international uh, component to the council that I think has been very um, helpful. As you can tell, um, I'm not Irish uh, myself uh, and uh, we've always had a strong international contingency, contingent that I think breaks that link a little bit. So that's the appointment part. The second part is the budget. Um, so our budget is independent of the government. It's not on the main budget round. It's on the set. There's a special budget sort of account which is used for the diplomatic service and the, the judi judiciary. Uh, and we were added to that. And that's something the council insisted on. And that has some drawbacks in other respects, but it means that the government can't come to us and say, look, we don't like what you said. Uh, we're going to cut your budget. Um, so that gives us a high degree of protection. I think that's a very important thing. If you look around the world, there's quite a lot of fiscal councils that have been threatened in various ways by governments where, when they've uh, said things they don't like. And I think what that does is that it puts us in a position where you know, we, we really speak truth to power. And so you know, when the government has done things well, we're, we're happy to welcome that. But where we think that they're making mistakes, we we're very happy to, you know, we're very much prepared to say that publicly uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and anticipating the government may not necessarily be very happy with what we're going to say about them. Um, uh, and just a final, final question, because I know that other people are looking at me here. Uh, this, the, um, have you had OECD come back and do an audit of what you've, you've been doing and how you've managed it? And have, who's been marking your homework and how have you been made, be able to ensure that you're still following best practice? Uh, that's a good question. Maybe, Eddie, you want to answer that? Yeah, so we had exactly that homework um, that correction exercise just last year, and it was a fairly intense audit. Uh, we call it a review. 
uh, by the OECD where they, they look through everything really in terms of how we're set up, what uh, our staffing and resources are and, and what our output looks like and the impact that we've had in the media and on public debate. Um, so, so they went through a very broad range of terms of reference and the, the conclusions, they're, they're publicly available along with the full review and Sebastian kind of alluded to them in the opening statement. But broadly, I would say they're, they're very positive in that they feel they've, we've had a strong impact uh, on public discourse and in terms of advancing how these things are looked at as well within the department, but also uh, more generally. Okay, thanks very much indeed. Sir Malisha. Good Chair. I was trying to roll the line, so you're both very welcome here today. Uh, just in relation to the uh, Fiscal Council of South Irish, Fiscal Advisory uh, Council, uh, you were established, to say, 10 years ago, just at the time of the, the, the bank collapse. Uh, do you believe that if the council had been in place prior to that, that uh, you'd have been in a position maybe to sound alarms or at an, at an earlier stage uh, help government to actually avoid that crisis? Uh, I hope so. Um, if, if we had been around and not done that, I think it would have been a failure of our, of our institution. And I think the way what we would have, could have done to have helped signal that, I think, is partly to develop the analysis to show um, and there are some issues, I, I mean, I used to work as an economist on Ireland at the time, and there were some things, for example, like the Department of Finance didn't know how much VAT was coming from the new build of houses. It turned out it was a huge amount, and when housing sales stopped, uh, that, that was a major squeeze and a major loss of revenue. Uh, now, I think the council at that point would definitely have said you need to do the work to find out how much this is and to understand the risks. So I think we would have. I think we would have done it. I can't guarantee it would have worked because, as I said, it depends a lot on the willingness of the political system to hear that message. Uh, but I think it, it, you know, it definitely would have helped. And I think one comment we've seen lately, if you go back before the COVID crisis, there was a, you know, some risks of overheating in the Irish economy, uh, and there was, I think, a, a comment that at least people had been warned there were problems uh, this time around, uh, whether they took action or not. Yeah, well, and actually, uh, that just in relation to that as well, too, you had mentioned in your uh, introduction uh, just some of the issues, and one of them being that it depended very much on the information that uh, you actually get from government as such. You know, so what's your process for acquiring data from government? And uh, would you say that you always get the data that you ask for, or does legislation or is legislation required in, in order for a government release to release to you the information that you would need to ensure the uh, accuracy of your protection and the likes? So that's a very good point and it's actually a point that was brought up in the OECD review. So of course the council needs all sorts of information from the government, often very detailed. Uh, we don't have a legal right to that information. Uh, fortunately cooperation has been quite good uh, we have a memorandum of understanding covering some aspects of information around forecasting, but, but that's it. And it's obviously voluntary and non-binding on the two parties. Uh, in terms of information, most of the time we do get what we want. Um, the two limits are firstly, it often takes a huge amount of effort and time for us to do that. It would be much nicer if we got information faster. And secondly, sometimes the government simply doesn't have the information we're asking for, um, which is obviously a, a different problem. Now, in the context of the OECD review, they asked that we should have a right to, or we should, the government should consider giving us a right to information. Uh, we've looked at the UK legislation for the OBR. Uh, in, and in our view, that would be perfect for us, uh, and I think would probably be perfect for almost anyone. So I would suggest that in setting up arrangements in Northern Ireland, you look at the OBR legislation, because I think that, to me, would cover our, at least our needs, but I'm sure the needs in Northern Ireland perfectly. Yeah, that sounds like very good advice. Cormila Malga, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Melissa. Jim? Um, just a couple of points, if I might. When we look at the need for a fiscal council in the Irish Republic and in Northern Ireland, we're of course largely comparing apples with oranges because the Republic, so far as you can be a sovereign country within the EU, is a sovereign uh, jurisdiction and you raise your own taxes and then you have to balance that with your spending and your borrowing. So there's a very obvious role for a fiscal council. 
In our situation, of course, we, as a devolved region, region depend upon a block grant and there isn't that same balancing exercise to be performed. So what is it that you see that a fiscal council in Northern Ireland could usefully do? So I think this comes back to the point that I made, made at the beginning, and I, I think it's important is, is that you need to think, of, it's important to think about what problem uh, uh, a council can, can overcome. Um, and the, what the council can bring is this independence, uh, this um, analytical power, and also for kind of commitment to transparency that governments, you know, government officials are often, uh, in, you know, often we're able to articulate things to the public in a way that's much clearer than, than the government decides to take. Uh, now you're right that the situations are obviously very difficult, uh, different, um, uh, and I guess we're not in a particularly good position to know exactly in the context of Northern Ireland. There are, if you look around the world, there are fiscal councils or bodies that do many different things. Uh, some are much more active on the expenditure side uh, in terms of of how government spending is is uh, uh, is costed, uh, its efficiency, and that kind of thing. Those might be areas that are more relevant. Uh, in the Irish context, it's not a big issue, uh, but it may be uh, for you. Uh, and in terms of, like one's aware that there's a something of a looming controversy about corporate taxation. Uh, is that something that the Fiscal Council has in the South has been involved in or is likely to be involved in? So our, our involvement, as I said, the, 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 our, our council is very much set up to deal with macroeconomic instability, which has plagued the Republic uh, for a long time, uh, and hopefully uh, we're contributing to reduce. Um, on the corporation tax side, what we have done is look at that very much in the context of our budgetary and economic forecast. And I think there we've done a lot to raise people's understanding of the risks associated with the reliance on corporation tax. So corporation tax, uh, Eddie can correct me, but is like, I think last year it was almost 20% of revenue came from that. That's and right. most of that is paid by a small number of firms uh, and multinational firms. And so that leaves public finance is very vulnerable because against that, on the other side, it's been used to finance you know, hospitals and schools and things that you know, need permanent funding. Um, and so we've been very vocal in advocating for that. And we've suggested that essentially uh, there's a need to wean public spending off that source and find another source of revenue uh, to, uh, to replace it. And in the meantime, that funding should be put into something like a rainy day fund because it's, not going to, it's unlikely to be there forever. So we've been very active on that side. Um, you know, we take the tax rate and the tax regime as given. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a political choice for the government. But conditional on their choices, uh, we've been very active in explaining to people what the consequences of it are. We also realise the consequences are probably bigger in terms of the economic side effects than most people thought about. So that's where a fiscal council can provide analysis for politicians to choose. But we can help people to understand what's at stake. So in your 10 years of existence, what's been your biggest achievement and your biggest failure? The biggest failure is probably easier to answer, which is, you know, the government has taken a lot of our advice, but there's other things they really have, they haven't taken our advice on. Probably, in our view, fiscal policy should have been a little bit tighter than it was in the last few years. There was a big run up in health spending, essentially financed by corporation tax, that was not a good idea. Um, and so I think, um, I think the failure is that, um, you know, we did a lot of what we, as much as we could, we felt, but ultimately, uh, you know, the, we weren't as strong as the political pressures uh, pushing in the other way to spend. Uh, I think in terms of our successes, um, I think there are two really. One is on the technical side. So for example, bringing in like a proper measure of where the economy stands, whether it's overheating or whether uh, or not, uh, was a massive achievement and is a big, big change and gives policymakers a clear roadmap of where things are going. I think the other one is in terms of the debate that I think when I hear people in, the, in you know, politicians or journalists talking about things, I think you can hear they're talking about them in language that's, and ideas that we've developed. And there's much greater awareness now uh, of these kinds of challenges. Now, unfortunately, that doesn't always feed through into decisions, but there is just an awareness of these things that there wasn't before. And I think that makes it much harder for ministers to, to make bad choices because they know that there's a lot of people out there who, who are watching them and understand where the weaknesses are and what they're saying. Uh, my final question. Is there any relationship between the work of what's now called the shared island unit 
and the Fiscal Council? Uh, no. You haven't been asked to do any work on that? No. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh Thank you, Chair. I want to thank uh, Dr. John Preston and Dr. Tracy as well for giving me time to us today. Uh, I just have one simple question. Northern Ireland's executive budget process it often runs uh, late on to delays or disputes within with the Westminster government and on to the occasional political dispute down here in, in, in the north as well. That's fixing key dates. Uh, for publication of reports on the budget, the independent fiscal council may be problematic. How does the Irish uh, IFAC council, uh, how do you get around this problem? Um, to be honest, I think it's actually a weakness in our setup, but it's very hard to do things about. Uh, let me explain. Uh, the budget is um, it has to be made before the 15th of October. Um, there's then various processes of parliamentary debate that take place in the following weeks. Uh, uh, in parallel, we work on a report looking at the budget, but unfortunately doing that report takes a lot of time uh, because we need to get a lot of information from the Department of Finance. The budgetary documentation doesn't tell us enough really to, to assess properly what the budget says. Um, and so essentially the politicians are more or less debated and voted on it before our report comes out. And that's a long-standing problem. And we've, we've partly addressed it by putting out a sort of flash release a few days after the budget that gives our preliminary high-level assessment of things, but where we have to say a lot of these figures are preliminary because we haven't got information from the government. So this is probably a case where you don't want to follow our practice. Uh, you want to learn kind of the opposite lesson. Uh, which is, I th think, like the UK does this much better, I think, uh, with the OBR, that I think it's important that the Fiscal Council is provided with confidential information ahead of the budget um, and during the process. Uh, and also just the quality, so that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is the quality of budget documentation should be much higher. Uh, so it should be possible for experts such as ourselves to, to, to read the budget and find almost, almost everything we need there. Instead, we go through a process with the Department of Finance in, in, in Dublin, uh, where we have to keep asking them to explain how they've calculated things, where they got this number from. So I think if you have those two things, your fiscal council could play a much more active role in the budget process than, than we can. We, we feel like we come in a bit afterwards and say, well, this is what was wrong with it. Um, but in some ways, it's a little bit late by then, uh, and we're really looking forward to the, to the next year. So I think a process where the Fiscal Council is able to be part of it. They shouldn't be part of it, but they should get information kind of in real time so that when it comes out, they've got the information they need. And where the budget documentation is much more uh, transparent is, is what I would suggest that you do. Um, okay, it seems quite a lot there, but I suppose, um, what, what's the easiest way then that you see for us to get that? I mean... I mean, that could be held back from us. That could be stopped or is that information it looks like is held back from yourselves? I mean, is there a way of writing that in? I, th I think you'd have to look at the way the legislation was written to, to, to write it in um, and write okay. it into the process. And I think also if there's an agreement at the beginning, maybe not in legislation, but there's an agreement about the exact timing of things and what's to be shared. Um, one suggestion we got from the OECD, which will follow up, is for the Fiscal Council to draw up a list of the standard things that it needs. Um, so so we, we don't have that at the moment, so we're always making kind of ad hoc requests. Now, there's always one of the things that makes the Fiscal Council exciting, there's always some kind of thing you didn't anticipate, so it wouldn't fall in the scope of that probably. But if you can at least get 90% of what you needed, and actually, to be honest, those things shouldn't, one principle we've always applied is that we don't really want information in private. You know, we want things that we get to be on the record and usable by us. We don't want to be in a position where there's some sort of special side room where the Fiscal Council talks to the government. Now, sometimes that's necessary. For example, you know, in this proposal, the Fiscal Council would have to keep confidential information you know, ahead of budget day or ahead of decisions. But, but basically, you know, things should be, should be in the public domain for the Council to assess, but also for anyone else to assess as well. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Philip. Yep, thank you. Uh, it's very interesting so far. In, in a previous answer, you, you were talking about, the, the, I think you said the one of the government departments wasn't aware of the levels of 
of, of VAT in relation to the house market. Uh, so, I mean, Melissa kind of asked you about whether you could have steered away the VAT in the south had you been in place. But in terms of the policies that previous Irish governments have had, which led to, I suppose, the creation of an unsustainable housing bubble, you know, is, that, is that something that, that you can comment on if such a, you know, if it were to happen again? Uh, uh, and can you publish uh, reports at your own discretion? You know, can you pick and choose a topic uh, which you deem appropriate to commission research on and then, and, and then come out with a report on? So, so, so we, we can publish uh, whatever we like. Um, we obviously have a mandate and we, you know, our, the mandate is really important because it gives us a kind of credibility that it's not, um, you know, in the public debate, there's lots of people have an opinion about the public finances, but having the mandate and the resources really to back up for what we're saying uh, means that, you know, the voice has a lot of authority, uh, but obviously we realize we shouldn't overuse that and, and it's only really in the areas of our mandate. So we have freedom to do that. And for example, the long term report that we did last year on aging, um, we see that as coming under our long our assessment of the fiscal stance because we think we can't do that without understanding the long term, but we don't have a specific mandate to do that. And in general, we have taken the view, which I think is the only sensible view you can take, that um, you know, we focus essentially on issues most closely related to our mandate. There are other areas we're reluctant to get into, but occasionally we will. Um, and so you know, anything that really relates to choices about how the government spends its money or how it raises taxation, we essentially view as being outside the scope of the council. Our, our thing is really to make sure that the public finances add up and, and the economic management is sound. But there are cases where we have raised issues on sp specific things. So for example, a couple of years ago, public investment in Ireland was very, very weak. Uh, now, normally we wouldn't take a view on the right level of public investment, but we said, look, this is really, really weak. Uh, and if you do this, you know, it's hard to see how public services can continue to be delivered and how the economy will grow. So there we took a view on, a, on an issue about fiscal choices beyond the budget. And I think there are also issues in relation to taxation or, for example, the housing market, we haven't said what we think you should do about it. It was a still, still a live issue in Ireland, but we have said there is a problem there. Um, and uh, you know, if house, housing costs rise a lot, that makes Ireland much less competitive. Um, and so that does need to be addressed in some way. Now, we didn't take a view as to how, and it's beyond our expertise to do so, but we do sometimes get into these more detailed policy choices. Okay, thank you. And then ju just finally, uh, the composition of the commission's part-time, uh, uh, are the current staff and arrangements sufficient in your view to carry out uh, your functions? So this is one of the things that came up in the OECD uh, review. Um, we basically, so we have a secretariat of the moment, uh, six staff, uh, very good young econ economists, uh, and we have um, we have a part time council uh, with five members, and me as chair, I'm part time as well. Um, the recommendation of the OECD was essentially to reinforce the chair's position um, because, to be honest, it is a stretch to do the chair's job with the amount of time that's allocated. So we hope that we will have, um, we, we've asked for more resources to cover making the chair's position uh, full time. We've also asked for one ex, essentially one extra posi economist position because we would struggle to do the long-term report again with the resources that we have. So to be honest, it's a little bit tight. I mean, it's quite a good model. I think uh, one of the things the OECD said was that relative to other countries, so we have a budget that's probably, uh, fairly typical, but our output is much higher. And that's actually because this hybrid model of having the benefits of council members who are doing other things and bring all sorts of experiences and stuff, mixing with the economists is actually a really good one. But at the moment, it is being done on a little bit of a tight budget. For, it's not really sustainable, I think. Uh, and the concern was it'd be very difficult, for example, to find a replacement chair because it's a very difficult responsibility to take on, given the amount of, uh, given the fees that are paid to the council member and the amount of time they can take. So, so it's not too far off, and it's a good model, but it, it is a concern, and it's one the OECD highlighted and one that we're raising with the Department of Finance. Grant, thank you, thank you very much, Chair. Thanks, Philip. Paul. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sebastian. This has been a very interesting uh, session. So thank you. Uh, my questions will 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 uh, teeter around the independence, and you've explained that rightly so far. Uh, explain to me again in a wee bit more detail how your budget is fixed 
through you, you, you talked about the judiciary too. So I take it it's it's lumped in with that type of thing. Uh, explain to me how that actually works, so that there's no government interference either way in your budget. So we so our budget is on a thing called the central fund, which is this the special fund that uh, is also covering the judiciary and the foreign service. That means it's not part of the annual budget round. So when people when politicians sit down and vote the budget, they're not voting on our budget because it's already just factored in through this central fund. Uh, and our funding, there was an initial amount, uh, and then it was indexed to inflation. So every year it rises a bit. Now, after 10 years, the thing that we've noticed is that our staff costs rise quite a lot more than inflation. And so essentially our budget in real terms has shrunk by quite a bit. Um, and that, this is one of the things that the OECD report mentioned. Uh, and so we, are, we have proposed the Department of Finance to implement the OECD uh, recommendations, which would basically be to index our budget to a mix of uh, 60% uh, public sector wages in Ireland and 40% um, inflation, which more accurately reflects our, our cost mix, and also to have a review process probably linked to our own review process. So the OECD review we did this year was part of the cycle that we have basically reviewing our performance every five years because we need someone to do that, we need someone independent. Um, and so probably at that time, it should always be a question to the review group as to whether the budget is still uh, fit for purpose. And then at that point, it might be necessary to, to adjust it as well. Yeah, I've got the OECD report in front of me here. Mm -hmm. and you're, you're quite right as, uh, with your detail on it and what it asks. I have an issue with this because I, I'm very much for transparency and openness and independence for a body like yourselves. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's what appeals to me with regards to this. Uh, but I also know that up here in Northern Ireland, we we have several examples that I could give to you. I'll, give, I'll pick on one. So you have a consumer council that does a lot of good work on behalf of the consumers in Northern Ireland, but their budgets are still determined by the departments. Uh, department. So you could argue that they're not actually independent, and if the department took a pick, they could really turn the screw on a consumer council body or other bodies uh, to really, if you like, cajole, scare or silence uh, now I'm not saying that's happening I'm saying it could happen because of the way the budget's set up and whilst you're you know I, I read the report as you've alluded to uh, it is fair to say is it not that you guys in the fiscal council down there you've hit your budget ceiling which is, is applied, implied here and that in itself means that you as a body are looking towards your government ministers to do something which then could imply that with that reliance, you lose independence. And, and also the staffing uh, part E of the executive summary talks about the fact that you know, you're, you're, you're needing prior consent of the Minister for Finance with regards to the grading structures. Um, so you see how you could very quickly lose independence or, or at least have a reliance on the Minister of Finance how do you combat that? So, so that's, that's a very good point. I think the on the grading, um, I think that's right. So a recommendation of the OECD review to, to remove that restriction. In practice, we've never had any problems with it. Um, it's a sort of uh, bureaucratic kind of thing, I think. But, but you're right, it would be good. Uh, you know, one of the recommendations of the OECD review is, is to remove that for precisely the reasons that you say. Um, on the budget, I think this arrangement of us being on the central fund uh, it's basically the right approach. Unfortunately, it was badly implemented by just linking it to price inflation uh, and not to something that more accurately reflected our cost mix. So I think having this combination of wage and price inflation uh, and then this review process essentially initiated by the independent review, I think that's as good as it gets, actually, and I think that gives us a lot of freedom. Obviously, right now, it puts us in a very uh, tricky, well, not very tricky, a slightly tr delicate position because we are asking finance to raise the ceiling and essentially we need that to happen. Um, I can assure you that it has no impact on the analysis that we, we're presenting at the moment. Um, I think as well, so I think that's basically the best you can do. Of course, there's always a word, you know, legislation is what it is, the government's the government. They could always come along and pass a piece of legislation that closed down the fiscal council tomorrow. Um, so you're never completely free from that. But I think by making it difficult uh, to do, uh, I think it you know, raises the bar and makes it much less likely to happen. Uh, and ultimately, I think the real protection 
is actually in the political system as a whole. Um, I think if we, uh, you know, we have a report coming out next week, if the Minister for Finance were to not like that and say he was closing down the council, um, I think that would cause a, an almighty um, amount of trouble politically. Uh, and so I think it's the support of you know, all the stakeholders, but parliamentarians uh, across the political spectrum, uh, you know, key stakeholders, the public, I think that's the ultimate protection. But of course, by making it difficult to, for them to do that by setting the bar in terms of having it in the special fund and this indexation, uh, I, I, think, I, I think that's a very good arrangement if it's implemented properly. Can I ask then about the, the point you raised about uh, the, the fiscal cycle in the government down in the Republic? Mm-hmm. And the fact that it seems to be, and these are my words, that you're always marking the government's homework, rather that because of the, the delay in getting the information that you require, instead of what I would strikes me as a better position whereby you're actually informing the budget at an earlier stage if you were to obtain that information sooner, uh, does it feel like you're always marking the government's homework? It feels like that a little bit for the reasons that I said, that, for example, in budget time, Budget comes out mid-October, it's debated over the next number of weeks, uh, and usually by the time that's more or less over, you know, our report is ready, and we've, we've reduced the delays there, we work very hard during that period, but we just rely on, on other information, and it just takes time uh, to do stuff. Um, so th- in a way that feels a little bit unsatisfactory, you're right. However, it's more of a, an ongoing cycle. So we also produce a report in the spring, which is about to come out, um, and that partly you know, is a review of the stability program, which is produced in April, but it also looks ahead to the budget. Um, and we also produce a pre-budget statement, which is usually a much shorter piece, just about, you know, three weeks before the budget as well. So, uh, and then we produce this flash release on the day of the budget. So it's not as if people don't, you know, I, th- I think people have a pretty good idea of what we think uh, at all times. And that's why we've been, we didn't originally have the pre-budget statement, but we realized that, you know, going back to May, June was, was too long for people to remember. Uh, and of course, things changed over the summer. And this flash release is, is a new thing uh, as well. So I think you know, it, it, it is a little bit of a problem, but I think we are contributing to the debate in an ongoing way. And also sometimes, I mean, last March as COVID was hitting, for example, I wrote an, uh, an op-ed in the Irish Times that basically set out the council's view on um, the reaction to COVID, um, basically said that we thought it was okay for the government to borrow a lot of money uh, to support the economy. Um, so I think these, you know, there are other ways of informing the debate, but I think as you think about arrangements uh, in Northern Ireland, if you want to get more out of the council, uh, a better arrangement is to allow the council um, access to information before it's published um, uh, so they can have us a bit of, bit of a head start uh, and also to improve the transparency and the information that's available in general uh, to speed up that assessment. If I may, just I think that's a really good point that you raise. I mean, one thing I would say is that a lot of the issues tend to be recurring. So if you think of the big budget mistakes that could be made or have been made in the past, they tend to be things that come up uh, over a kind of process of several years. So, you know, a, a certain policy uh, stance might be introduced in year one, but it's only really year two, year three, year four, year five after they kind of change big, you know, rates, income tax rates, tax bans, or or whatever you know spending policy they embark on, uh, that it really starts to uh, impact. So while we do backward looking assessments, they tend to kind of inform the next budget and the discourse coming into that, uh, and even more then if it's it's coming up in a second year. Can I ask your relationship with the scrutiny committees in the Irish government? So, so I know that the OBR has uh, MOUs with uh, Revenue and Customs, Work and Pensions, Treasury itself. But what, what, how do you guys go along with the scrutiny committee for Department of Finance down there? And you know, are you, are you a bit like a tag team? Is that how it works? <laughs> Um, so, so we basically engage with them uh, mostly uh, twice a year, basically when our big reports come out, uh, and we have a long, uh, you know, we have a big discussion where we present our views. Uh, and I think that dialogue has been very good. I think in the, I've been on the council since it was founded. In the early days, I think people weren't quite sure uh, what to do with this, but I think, I think uh, we've, it, we now have a very good kind of relationship. 
Uh, I think we actually learn a lot from the parliamentarians as well in terms of what they're interested in and how they think about the world. Uh, I think you can see that the way they think about the world has been shaped by, by analysis that, that we've done. Um, so I think it's a very sort of good relationship. I think as Eddie says, it's more about long-term themes in a way than specific things. So one big problem that we've had with, one big issue that we've had is that the way the Department of Finance does its budget projections typically doesn't really take into account the cost of providing existing public services. Uh, this is actually an issue in the UK as well. Um, and we've been pushing on that for a long time. And now I think the Parliament and the members of that committee understand that. Um, and so when they see projections from the Department of Finance, I think they will naturally ask them, are you taking this into account? Because they know uh, that it probably isn't. Um, so I think that's an example of, of how it works. But we're not more closely integrated into the process than that. And that's partly to do with this delay in the... Um, this, like, this delay between the budget coming out, say, and our reports coming out. Now, now, there's now a parliamentary budgetary office, and I think they're also, to an extent, able to fill that gap. Uh, they tend to, um, their analysis doesn't go as deep as ours does, I think, by and large. You know, it's, it, there's, but their mandate is much more to support the parliamentary process, and so I think they are helpful to parliamentarians in that process and perhaps fill the gap a little bit, um, bridging to, to our sort of heavier reports that come a bit later. Okay, thank you very much. Thank Stop. you. Matthew. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you both for your evidence today and the really helpful background brief um, that you mm -hmm. supplied uh, to it. Um, a few questions. Um, one, um, you, you don't uh, have independent forecasting um, uh, capacity. Well, you may have the capacity, that your, your economists may be able to do it, but you don't do independent forecasts. And, or own a proprietary model or anything like that, uh, either economic or fiscal forecasts? We, we do. Um, so so the, the, the setup is that um, uh, the Department of Finance does both macroeconomic and budgetary projections. We're required to assess both of those uh, and we're required to endorse the macroeconomic projections that the Department of Finance sends to the EU as, as part of their official documentation. Now, to do that, we've always taken the view that the only way we could do that is by essentially doing the same exercise ourselves and developing the tools to do it. Sometimes we use similar tools to finance, but we've also developed our own tools, uh, either on top of that or, or, or separate to that. Now, some fiscal councils around the world don't do that. They just look at um, other people's projections and see, you know, is the Department of Finance being very optimistic compared to what everyone else thinks? But we really felt that we needed to understand, sort of get our hands into the engine and, and understand how it works. So we actually have those projections. Our macroeconomic projections, we publish, we call them benchmark projections in the, uh, in the back of our reports. Um, we don't draw a huge amount of attention to them, mostly because... Now, often the differences with the Department of Finance projections are quite small, um, and so we don't want it, you know, people can easily get caught up with the fact there's a sort of decimal point difference somewhere. Um, and you know, our own forecasts are really designed to help us think about it. You know, maybe if we were actually really pushing in this forecast, we would, we would polish them a bit more maybe. Um, but we do do basically both, and I think on both sides, the modeling, and we don't, we don't have a full macro model, we're not big enough to do that, and to be honest, it might not be very helpful. But we have a very rich suite of models. We have an awful lot of tools that we've developed over time. And it's the same on the public finance, on the budget side. We've also collected data that didn't exist before. So, for example, you know, a key thing on the public finances is how much revenue will be raised as the economy grows. Um, and we collected new data for that and estimated new models. So I think we have, you know, we've basically developed the best estimates there are uh, in Ireland for that. Okay. Um, uh, is that forecasting so the, the, you're forecasting so unlike for example the OBR the forecast isn't a, a kind of a core part of your public role but it's something that you it has to be done in order to um, give ballast to your scrutiny rule is it required in the legislation that you do it or is it just something that you've done because you think you need to have it in order to fulfill your statutory obligations I think it's the second. So I think we see these, um, we're not required to produce a projection of any sort, but as I said, it's absolutely crucial, I think, for us to go through the same exercise. Otherwise, when we see things in the Department of Finance, we have no idea whether they've done a good job or not, because we don't understand kind of what the issues are uh, and how they're doing it. And I don't think it would be particularly helpful to really have two sets of 
slightly different numbers uh, from different people uh, in circulation. We do publish what we have, and actually, um, in some of our reports, you know, on if we think there's a big difference with the government, we've produced uh, alternative scenarios, or we've produced some adjustment to numbers that the Department of Finance have made. If we think those are a better guide to understanding the public finances, but we have we don't have a full forecast exercise, and a lot of the time, you know, the difference is not huge either. Um, so having two slightly different sets of numbers, I think, would not add very much. There's a second benefit as well from doing all this work, uh, which is that you have a much better understanding of what's actually happening on the economy on the ground, in that you can, you know, think through every single sector um, and, and kind of pattern that's developing, and you can really spot very clearly are there imbalances or, or, or strange things that would affect how taxes are being raised, uh, and you know what might happen. Uh, in terms of the sustainability of those tax rates, tax receipts long term. So I, I think it is a very valuable exercise. Um, whether or not you want to put it in as something that's essential for a fiscal council to do is a, another question. Okay. So, but you, you, you think it's you would say it's very useful, but you, but, but it's um, this is a question we're debating about the um, how essential it is to have um, sort of independent or freestanding fiscal and, and economic forecasting um, power. Um, on the, in terms of the, the, when the legislation came about that created IFAC, obviously it was at the moment when the Troika was heavily involved in, um, uh, in, in debates with finance and, uh, and, and all that. Do, are there particular things about your role and the legislation underpinning you that you think are, um, uh, what, what am I trying to ask? That were products of that particular moment that are um, uh, that aren't necessarily useful to your ongoing uh, work, but were sort of put in place at a very particular moment whenever there was there were um, uh, other factors at play in terms of fiscal sustainability and financial stability, etc. I think the simple answer is no. Um, okay. uh, I think our mandate is actually very good. Um, I think it covers. You know, looking at the macro forecast, which is where most of the errors have been made in the public finances in Ireland. It involves looking at the budgetary part, where there are also errors and issues. Um, for example, uh, systematic overruns in the health budget um, has been a big issue. Uh, over reliance on corporation tax, these sorts of issues. Um, uh, obviously, we monitor the fiscal rules, which is an important thing to do. Um, they're an important part of, of the framework. And then something that's actually very unusual is this um, mandate to assess the fiscal stance. Now, my sense is that only uh, a handful of other fiscal councils have that mandate. I think mostly those that copied those from the Irish arrangements. Um, but I think it's actually very good. I mean, I think basically the bottom line is, is, is that's what people want to know, right? They want to know are the public finances on track? Are they sustainable? Uh, are there issues? Are they contributing to the good functioning of the economy? Um, and so I think it's very good to ask that very general question. It also opens up the potential to deal with a, a wide range of other issues, including this sort of long-term sustainability issue, yeah. um, which is a big one. The demographics uh, in, in the Republic are such that aging is going to happen pretty fast uh, in the years ahead, uh, and people need to know that. So I think it's actually a very, very... Um, I think it's a really good mandate. I think it, and I think if you were doing it again today, I think that's exactly what I would do. Um, oh, th okay, that's great. Thank you. On debt sustainability, and that the la kind of something, something you just touched on there, are you looking at the minute? At the, so obviously, we are in a very particular moment in terms of huge growth in sovereign debt because of um, the pandemic and response to it. Um, how much of a how, how mandated are you to look in a dynamic way at sort of debt sustainability, uh, sovereign debt sustainability m more generally? Um, are you looking at it at the minute? Obviously, the, the IMF in particular, but obviously the OECD will look at this too. But is your, are you looking at a kind of static picture in terms of debt sustainability that like there is in a kind of, because it, obviously views on this have changed since a decade ago. I think that's true, and it's something we're looking about obviously a lot. And that's where the fiscal stance mandate is very good because I think it really falls under that. Now, it might fall a little bit if you were just doing an assessment of the budgetary projections, but then you're just doing a sort of positive assessment and maybe some risk analysis around it. Well, actually, as you say, it raises much deeper questions. Uh, and, the, and so having this mandate to look at the fiscal stance 
Uh, and I think the fiscal stance is actually most of what gets the media attention and the public interest. People aren't particularly bothered about how you get there in terms of the forecasts and things. Those are very important to a technical audience, but not to a general audience. But people basically want to know whether the public finances are on track or not. Uh, and they want an independent and expert read of that. And that's basically what we're doing on the council. Uh, now, in terms of the sovereign debt situation in the early days of the council, obviously the, you know, the, the government didn't have access to markets. Um, and so we did think we were thinking a lot about that and about meeting targets and things like that. Fortunately, we're not in that environment anymore. But I think as, as the situation has changed, it's become a very big part of what we do. And we do a lot of modeling on that. So traditionally, we've always had projections of, um, of debt, but we've always looked at the uncertainty around them. We've used you know, fan charts, which you basically show the likelihood of different outcomes around that. Um, and more recently, we've developed, uh, in fact, Eddie has developed an excellent model that allows us to do a, a more, more complicated model-based version of that called Stochastic Debt Sustainability Analysis. Uh, and we find that very, very useful. Um, and we've also done a lot of work this year on these big picture questions about the level of debt. Um, so again, uh, actually Eddie and I and, uh, and Eddie on council, we wrote a paper really about the implications of very high debt, low interest rates. And in Ireland, there's a huge difference between the interest rates, which are very low, and the growth rate, which is potentially quite high. Uh, and we wrote a lot about that, and we basically came to the conclusion that the debt dynamics are really favorable at the moment, but the risks are very high. And the higher debt is, the higher the risks are. Uh, and we actually also organized a major international conference in February with some of the top experts in the field, like uh, Olivier Blanchard, Charles Wiploch, um, uh, Philip Lane, uh, to talk about these questions. So we've really tried to have a, as lively a debate within the wider economics community, it was mm -hmm. an international conference, um, but also, um, but also you know, within Ireland as well, as well, about these kinds of questions and within the councils. We want to really deliver the best advice on this. So, so, and these are big, big new questions that we're facing. So, yes, we really have, um, I think, tackled those questions under this stance um, mandate. Thank you. Two, two just, very brief questions, Chair, for me. Um, I mean, ask one about the central bank, and then I can I'll give you a third one. But which the European central bank or the Irish? No, Irish central bank. What's the relationship with the Irish central bank? I was uh, going to ask one, but you, you can ask, you can ask that one. one. <laughs> That's but it's a good question. Um, uh, well, no, you've ever distracted me, Chair, because it goes on as a question for the CB. <laughs> um, on the question of uh, corporation tax, you've mentioned your concern about the um, ongoing revenue, but the um, over-reliance on CT revenues. There's clearly a big, um, that, there's a, you know, there's a, both a fiscal debate and also a political debate and an international uh, debate about um, co uh, corporation tax rates. Co corporation tax rates. Um, what is your, um, what's your next move on that, as it were, or do, or do you kind of um, do you just do you decide at, the net, at, a, at a forthcoming fiscal event to say something about it if you feel it's worth saying something about? If it's if there's a live political debate, for example, inside the EU or involving the Biden administration about. Um, Corporation tax rates, and that will, you know, that debate will obviously include the the, the Irish rate. Um, at what, do, how do you make a judgment over whether to say something, and do you have to calibrate that with the kind of political context? So, so we do intervene on different issues as they come up. Um, so, if there's a debate on a particular subject, and we've got work, we've done views, we'll we'll try and get that out there in some form, either either through social media or, or through traditional media. Um, on the corporation tax issue. Um, our job is really to assess the state of the public finances. It's not to advise on tax policy. Um, and so we would take uh, no part in that decision on the tax policy. We were looking at the consequences conditional on tax policies that are chosen, uh, either internationally or, or in Ireland. Okay. And then my final question, which will lean into what the chair wants to ask, but it is if, so at the, within the last hour, I see the ECB have put out a, um, uh, Another um, well, a warning has been reported as a warning anyway about um, uh, so not a warning with sovereign debt levels, but the potential for volatility because of roughly you know 100% debt to GDP ratios in Eurozone countries. D how much do you have to do you have to triangulate with what the, w in terms of what the ECB says? Obviously, you don't have to ape or echo what the ECB says, but um, is there an obligation for you to be? for your um, fiscal analysis to not be completely uh, 
to not completely contradict what is being said um, by, for example, the ECB? So I think our analysis is, is totally independent and we look at the situations in Ireland subject to our mandate and we make an assessment on that. You know, we obviously look at what happens in the world. We, perhaps more relevant for us is the fiscal debate at the European level. Yeah. Um, you know, there may be times where you know, the overall European fiscal stance obviously impacts on, on, on everyone. Um, and there's a question also of how much you know, Ireland, you know, Ireland's are often an outlier in these things. Uh, and how much to contribute to wider efforts, but uh, mostly those are pretty second order issues for us. But but we're absolutely independent, so we do not, you know, uh, we don't take our cues from the Department of Finance or from ECB or, or anyone else. We just try and make uh, the best analysis we can as as economists and experts of uh, the situation. Okay, no, uh, to be sure, I wasn't in any way suggesting that you are, you take direction from the ECB or another European institution. I suppose I was just asking about how you. Base yourself on that debate. Please. Yeah, thanks very much. So, so, just two very short questions. Um, one, if you can do it quickly, what's your relationship with the central bank? And the second question is the red flag function. Um, having been around and seeing how economists were absolutely castigated who dared say that sort of the Irish economic model was uh, flawed and it was coming off the rails and uh, you know it was all going to collapse in a big snottery heap. And I saw, you know, at fairly close hand, the sort of vitriol that was put towards the messenger, even though everybody could see that it was happening, and particularly housing was overheating. And the way you, you mentioned the issue about housing again, and that red flag position, can you just sort of say, you know, how well you think your red flag message should be listened to? And uh, is there any mechanism for you to be able to make sure that, that gets through loud and clear? Bearing in mind, you know, I've seen what's happened in the past, and I'm, you know well as I do, as many economists around Dublin are still wear the scars of having to say the emperor has no clothes on. So, so, so on the central bank, um, we obviously have a kind of relationship with them uh, on different things, but I would say, you know, essentially our roles are fairly independent, fairly different. We we do cooperate on, we do work together on on some issues. We work together a little bit on modelling. Uh, we obviously talk to each other and, and that kind of thing, but really different institutions doing different things. In terms of the red flag function, I mean, I think we are, I think there's no doubt in our minds that, that we will say the truth and we'll say it very publicly. Um, you know, whichever way that goes, it might be a message people want to hear. It might be a message that, that people uh, don't want to hear. And, and I think as well as a council, independence, you know, we're not an independent body, we're not a political one, but we do fit, we do think a lot about communication and how we impact the debate. Um, and we know, and the thing that actually comes back to the mandate, the mandate is a very powerful thing because if, if we say something, it's not just the opinion of someone who's looked at it or has an opinion. It's, it's based on a lot of work and we're the body that's been officially mandated by, by, the, uh, by the parliament basically to say these things. Uh, and so that's a lot of power. So we use it carefully. Um, you know, if there are, we realize, you know, it'd be easy for us to get headlines any day of the week if we liked by coming out with things, but you know, that's not, you know, that, that, you know, that's not what we're about and that wouldn't ultimately work. So we're very careful to measure our communication so that when we genuinely think there's a problem, it should be very clear to people that that is a problem. Uh, and I think we see that in the public debate that I think the media and parliamentarians realize, you know, sometimes there are small things that we're criticizing, but, you know, just room for improvement in a sense. But when we come out and, you know, not every report we do have, has these kind of messages. Sometimes we are not in that position. But when we do come out and say, look, there's a problem with this, I think people do take it. Um, uh, people do take it very seriously. Now, of course, then it comes into a political debate where there are other forces at work. The force essentially to spend more money and not really fund it properly is a very powerful force, right? I think, and that's really why fiscal councils have been one of the reasons why fiscal councils have been set up. Now, I'm not, so, you know, I think the recent evidence is that we can't necessarily, you know, we're not. So uh, our mandate is not so powerful that when we say something, that means that you know bad things won't happen. Um, but I think it's one of the forces that that that, that is there. You know, we do our best, and I think we're we're in a good position. I think other people uh, are also supportive of that, and and I, I guess we'll, you know, we have to see how it how how it plays out. But, I mean, certainly there is a clear sense that we have warned about some things. Uh, and I think that has been listened to. There are cases, okay, where ministers have explicitly said, 
uh, we have done this because the council said we should do this. Um, so I think that that's also a sign that we do have some traction. But of course, you know, there are many forces that, you know, that temptate. Public finances are very, very difficult, right? Everyone has loads of ideas about how to spend things. Uh, you know, people tend to find it harder to find other things to cut back or things or areas where they want to raise taxation. Um, and so it is a very difficult um, uh, challenge, uh, challenge to address. But I think we, we try to do our best. Okay. Sebastian, Eric, thank you very much indeed. And thank you very much indeed for your very informative evidence session. Uh, as we progress along our route towards hopefully getting our independent fiscal council up and running and legislated for, uh, could we keep in contact? And we'd be delighted if you uh, had an opportunity when we've had this up and running for a bit of time to indeed have a look over, just look at north of the border and see if you can mark our own homework as well. But thank you very much indeed. Happy to do that. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Tim. Okay, if we move on to uh, the next item of the agenda, Stephen, can you remove the members from the spotlight again, if they are, and add the witnesses to the spotlight, that's Annette and Barry. This oral, this oral evidence session is on Parliamentary Budget Office of the uh, House of the Eructus, uh on the Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland. Uh, we'll receive uh, oral evidence from the uh, Parliamentary Budget Office. Uh, the session is recorded by Hansard. Clark's briefing note is at page 58. Covering information from the Parliamentary Budget Office, page 66. Presentation on the estimates is page 68. And public spending is at page 88. And can I ask, Annette, are you speaking first or is it Barry? I presume you can you hear me okay? I, 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 take, it they're, I take it they're calling for a vote in the Eroctus, are they? I am. I'm in the convention centre, so apologies. The, uh, the bells have just <laughs> just started to ring, um, just to call the deputies back into the house. So apologies for that. Thank you, um, no. so, uh, Annette, uh, Annette, we're we're okay. We can wait a minute until the bells finish going. Okay. And, 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 okay. And, and, okay. Yeah, that that might be better. And I've sat in the well, conference centre we... often enough to know it's a fairly miserable experience to be sitting in there. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, there will be a couple of minutes, I think. Oh, that's fine. Better hold this. At the end of page seven, we could mute. Yeah, I've just asked her to mute, and then I'll go to page seven. Can you mute the network? Yes, sir. Uh, which bit are we at? Page seven, so the bit where uh, referred to pages fifty-nine. So. All right, okay. Uh, Tim, we're just going to go move ahead to sort of the end of this agenda item, and then we'll come back to Annette when the um, the, the gong is finished. I like members refer to uh, pages fifty-nine and sixty of the sixty of their meeting packs. The clerk has summarised the key options for an independent fiscal council which members may wish to consider. These include its function, discretion, powers, independence, competence, credibility, and assembly engagement. Members should also note, according to the new decade new approach, there would appear to be a role for the UK Government in approving a new Fiscal Council. Consideration of the above may provide clarity as to the appropriate format of the Fiscal Council and the timing of the establishment, including whether it might be initially established on a non-statutory basis with legislative following. Uh, members, do, do members have any commentary on any of these above items at this time? I just I, I sort of speaking as the chair, but also speaking as uh, sort of an independent capacity. I think my view is that we're increasingly seeing the requirement for this to be put on a legislative framework uh, to do that as well. But I just want sort of that recorded at this time. Yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah. Therefore, are members content to write to the other statutory committees seeking their views on the above, with a view to obtaining responses prior to the scheduled engagement with the Interval Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland on the 9th of June? Are we agreed? Great. Okay. And Annette, have we finished? <laughs> <laughs> Almost as good as the pigeon. <laughs> not quite, not quite not, as good. It is not as good as the pigeon. No. <laughs> so it was the Scottish Fiscal Commission when they were there last week. They looked that up. That, that's how they knew. <laughs> the, the Star calling card. Star calling card. <laughs> Raise it. Raise is now famous throughout the world. Yeah. <laughs> they should be asking for a raise next. Yeah. Uh, week. Is that an attempt at humour, Matthew? <laughs> yeah. We're probably up there in a Google search with uh, "catch the pigeon" cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> 
Mm. Uh, Sylvester and Tweety Bird. That's right. Yeah, let's uh, Tim. Let's have a quick look at the forward work program. So Everybody can speed up. with you. Yeah. Everything. And what page are we on for the forward? That will be page fourteen. Oh, page fourteen we'll for the, the forward brief. work program. Uh, if we've all got that in front of us. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Our uh, revised draft forward work program is in the table of items. It's understood the financial reporting departments and public borders bodies bill Northern Ireland was considered by the executive last week and will be introduced to the Assembly shortly in order to inform the members' understanding second stage of departmental briefing is scheduled next week, 26 of May. As indicated in correspondence, the Department also briefed on the main estimates and the budget on the 26th of May. Are we content with the agenda change for the two briefings? Are we agreed? Agreed. Owing to delays in the June monitoring round in order to ensure compliance with Article 13 of the Functioning Government Act, it is suggested that the Department's June monitoring submission be considered on the 2nd of June 2021. Or a week later, if necessary, as indicated previously, Assembly research will brief on the 2nd of June in order to inform members' understanding of the main estimates, etc. The Department has also provided a final briefing on the main estimates. Are we content with the agenda for the 2nd of June for three briefings? Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, the Chairperson for the Office for Budget Responsibility, Richard Hughes, has agreed to give oral evidence to the Committee on matters relating to the Fiscal Council. It is hoped that the evidence session will be on the 9th of June, but arrangements are being finalised. The Interim Fiscal Council for Northern Ireland will also be in attendance on the 9th of June with a view to the Committee setting out its Can position on the Fiscal Council. Oh. Mm. Additionally, the Ulster University will brief on the rates issue, including reform. Are we content for that agenda item for the 9th of June? Three briefings? Are we content? Okay. Yes. Agreed. And I think it's important we get that. Uh, actually, having the OBR is, uh, right. I think, it's important. Can I just suggest, sorry, Chair, on the 9th of June, we are due to have, sorry, we have the OBR plus. A and other. Sorry, so if you look at tabled items. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So it's on the, uh, if I look at it myself, um, it's uh, 9th of June then will be, we think, Office for Budget Responsibility, yes. followed by the Interim Fiscal Council, followed, followed by, by Nigel Hill, yeah, on Gareth Hetherington, yeah. M my only question about that is that's three quite enormous things to have mm. in one session. Can we put the rates one? I was thinking that myself. I mean, it might be. So, I mean, Having Richard Hughes, then the Fiscal Council. I mean, uh, I, I, I'm agnostic as to which. I just think those are having uh, Ulster University come in on rates are on. You know, that's a huge bit of evidence. The Fiscal Council is a huge bit of evidence. But having Richard Hughes, he's kind of our one of our key witnesses on the yep. Fiscal Council. So I think at the very max we can have is two. two. Yep. Uh, and even two, I think, is is a big. That's a big portion, as it were. I would. A, I would propose. I, 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 I will propose, and I'll have a chat with uh, Peter about moving the rates uh, brief on the rates issue. I just think that that would be too much on that day. Is, is that agreed, Chair? Yep. Sorry. Are we agreed to move the uh, um, uh, take the rates issue from the Ulster University of briefing on a separate occasion? I'm agreed. Certainly, I think that's great. The committee, is, uh, finally, the committee has uh, previously agreed to join a concurrent meeting with the Committee of the Executive Office and the Committee for the Economy and the High Street Task Force on the 16th of June. Rather than one briefing, this now appears to be a whole afternoon of briefings with, which may not be relevant to the banking issue, which was the committee's point of interest. Pat might like to come in on that one. Um, does the committee wish to... Uh, we are taking that to one meeting, Chair. Yep. Does the committee wish to? Uh, I was just saying here. Does the committee wish to forego the concurrent meeting and stick with its planned briefings on capital works, social value, value and procurement, and gender issues on the 16th of June, and then arrange a briefing with the from the financial services union banking concerns before the summer recess? Um, sort of. That just, would be good. Be very helpful. Right. So is that sorry, chairperson? So is that is that better then? I'm kind of how do we chat with the. Clerk to the committee for the executive office. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that briefing, High Street Task Force, is going to be a lot about banking. It's going to be a lot about other things. Mm -hmm. So maybe, as this came up at question time the other day, banking yeah. again. Maybe we will get the financial services yeah. union. Well, my, I mean, 
it's a really important issue. There's a, an open question as to how relevant it is to us. But it looks like the 16th of June we have, we're being asked whether we want a sort of miscellaneous, where we have a bit on capital works, mm -hmm. a bit on uh, gender legislation, and a bit on social value. I think, first of all, I think either one of those is, so I think there's a, COVID Recovery and High Street Task Force is there's a debate about how relevant that is to us. Then the other one again feels to me quite broad, quite broad, and quite an expansive agenda. And and uh, 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 so sorry, I'm saying I'm a technical issue. Sorry, yeah. um, it's a bigger pardon, chairperson. What did the member say was irrelevant or not? Oh, it's not, that, it's not that I'm saying it's irrelevant. I'm saying there is a question mark about the about how relevant the. I mean, I would be happy, perfectly happy, to sit in the concurrent meeting with. Um, TO committee and the economy committee under recognizing on that, that that's basically we're having we're devoting an afternoon to doing joint briefings with them mm -hmm. is that right that is correct yeah uh, I, I'm content with that but obviously there one or two call the chair has indicated that that might be we might or we might see that as slightly let out with mm -hmm. our responsibility but I, I I'm perfectly content to do it but I do think if we're not doing that then the having the reset going from the, the the alternative agenda for that day feels to me too undirected and too bulky. Yeah, just again, team, um, just looking at that, one of the things about obviously about the High Street Task Force is going to be very much about the recovery from COVID. And obviously, with our responsibilities and what we've been doing with sort of LPS, LRSS, looking at sort of finances um, and also looking at sort of rates and how rates are help, helping towards that. So, you know, I'm, I would quite Again, it's up to the committee, but uh, I think having a concurrent meeting with the TEO and the Committee for Economy on that is quite a, I think it's quite an important issue. Well, I, I, I don't disagree, if, but if we, if we do that, then I think either the following week or before or after that, we should have um, Mr. Hetherington and McGuinness in, not to call them other second names, because that's our bit that's critical, that critically links in, which is rates policy and how that links into that. that that's, yeah. Those two are completely inseparable. So if we do the COVID in the high street thing on the 16th of June, my suggestion would be that we take evidence from UUP, EPC, i.e. Uh, Gareth Hetherington and Owen McGuinness uh, on Wednesday the 23rd, if they're amenable. Chairperson, I think the issue is time machine yeah. hasn't been delivered and we're running out of, uh, we're near at the end of the session, so we only have the 23rd and 30th. Members have previously agreed not to have a meeting in mm -hmm. uh, July, so we are. Um, and I also understand from the chair's liaison's group that it's the intent not to um, do anything in the recess because of sort of issues with assembly staff, and obviously people need to do that as well. So, okay. so, um, I mean, what um, we have a briefing in on the NIAO. So if we, if we if at the minute we have on the twenty third of June, NIAO digitisation. I mean, I know we've this declared interest. I said in the PAC. My question would be: Is that an essential thing for us to do before recess? Clearly, there are other things around. Um, I would rather do the rates than uh, NIAO digitisation. Yeah, that's my, that's what, my, what I'm suggesting. Is that as an item we have done as an item on the twenty third of June. The NIA report into land and digitisation. That's an important issue, but it's effectively something that's looking back a decade. It, it is something that we should look into, but I don't think it's urgent for us. I don't think it's as urgent as uh, rates, or for that matter, stuff in the protocol. Um, so that would be my. Okay. So I tell you what, um, will I take it? I will take an action to uh, speak with the, the clerk and have a look at that sort of those last two sessions, if you're content. But working on the assumption on the 16th of June that we'll be doing the concurrent meeting with okay. the TEO and the Committee for the Economy, yeah, okay. I think that's important. Can I also ask, just because I wasn't on the gender identity legislation, have we, um, or do we have a specific, because I wasn't, I may have missed it in a previous meeting, have we, are we with the responsible committee? Yeah. And and where, is there draft legislation or are we taking a preliminary briefing? We're taking a preliminary, preliminary briefing. briefing. Uh, Ms. Dolan asked a question of the Minister. He indicated there'd be no legislation Sorry. in this mandate, but. Yeah. Um, Good, okay. It's, 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 it's important, good. but yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are we content with those actions? Mm -hmm. Content. Uh, members, uh, any other comments on the revised draft forward work programme? Are we agreed with the forward work programme as agreed? Mm -hmm. Agreed. Just, sorry, Sue Chair, are we also seeking a briefing from the Financial Services Union as well as doing the 16th of June High Street? 
Uh, uh, yeah. Check clerk, you repeat that. So, um, sounds like on the 16th of June we're going to do the concurrent meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, that's what you But do you on. also want a, a briefing, if we can get one from the Financial Services Union on banking issues? On the 16th? Uh, no, 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 it wouldn't be on the 16th because it'll be not, it'll, the only thing on the 16th will be that concurrent meeting. Uh, can, I ask, can I ask Pat to come in on that one? Because obviously, uh, I think the Minister is now aware of, of course, that we have this responsibility towards banking as well. And indeed, some of the questions that uh, were being directed towards the Minister about what's happening with uh, sort of banks and also what's going on with NatWest and some other banks as well. So, look, I'll, I'll, I'll take, I'll take your, I'll take your view on that. I, I think that we should go as best we possibly can and have that briefing from them simply because if yeah. all of it is fitted in together, the high streets, banking, trying to look at where we're going with, 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 with money is the most important part as far as I'm concerned for anyone that's trying to win or, or looking at trying to revive our high street. So if possible, I said it at the start of it, I would like to have given as much time as possible to that now before before we, we finish this term. So I would prefer that if we were able to go ahead and have that evidence given to us. Uh, take in mind that I've already had a session with them uh, about three weeks ago. So I think that would be very interesting for the committee for to hear their views on, 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 on where we are as well with that. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Yeah, good to that. I, mean, I, I, agree, I, I agree with Pat. My only comment is one for the Chair and Clark to consider is, I suppose, given where we are, like we need to think hard about what we are prioritising. Clearly, colleagues, things like rates, the high street, the, the, you know, the urgent economic situation, people are interested in things around protocol, I mean, you know, those are much more. The NIO, all I'm trying to say is the NIAO report into Landweb is not nearly as urgent. No, that's because I, having I take that well, not, not, no offence to the land to the report having having helped produce a ver one of it in the PAC. It goes back a decade, and there's been a lot of work done on it already. Okay, thank you, thank you very much indeed. Try going back to Annette. Annette. <laughs> yes, Chair sorry about person. sorry about that, and sorry you had to listen to our sort of uh, well, forward forward look, work uh, program. Apologies, the bells have stopped here. So okay. Annette, can you give your evidence now, just in case the bells start going again? <laughs> um, unless there's a crisis, I think we should be okay, Chairperson, I hope. But look, thank you very much for uh, for the invitation to to speak to the committee this afternoon. Uh, I'm very happy to do that. Uh, so look, I suppose, you, you know, you've heard a lot of detail from Sebastian and Eddie about the Fiscal Council. So I just thought that I'd I'd begin by just kind of setting out what the Parliamentary Budget Office does, and I suppose the the differences really between us and the Fiscal Council. So the Parliamentary Budget, or as we call ourselves, the PBO, we're an in-house parliamentary body that was set up by the Houses of the Oireachtas itself to provide it with tailored support for its role in the budgetary process. So this means that we give support for members in relation to the approval of spending, revenue raising legislation and oversight of the public finances and fiscal governance arrangements. So our work is very much aimed at meeting Oireachtas members' needs in this area. And we do this through publishing research and analysis and presenting our analysis to committees of the houses. So the office, uh, we're staffed by civil servants. We're, we're all civil servants and we currently have eight staff but we do have a number of vacancies and we are recruiting additional staff in the coming weeks. Our mandate is set out in legislation and it's in line with the OECD principles for independent fiscal institutions and PBOs, which I know that you're familiar with. So the PBO, it originates in the need for Irish parliamentarians to have access to expertise to better understand and engage with their role in the budget process. So in the early 2010s, on the government side, there was a number of different reforms introduced to the budget process. But Parliament's role 
hadn't changed at all. So in 2015, the Arapta Service commissioned a report from the OECD about how parliamentary scrutiny of the budget could be improved. And that report recommended setting up a budget committee so that the Oireachtas could have a specific forum to discuss budget issues in advance of the, of the budget. It also recommended setting up a parliamentary budget office to support that committee, other committees and members in general in their engagement on budgetary mass matters. So based on, on this, the PBO does have a special relationship with the Committee on Budget budgetary oversight. So I regularly appear before the committee to present our analysis of major government budget related documents or just to brief the committee generally on the economic and fiscal situation. These, situ these sessions are held in private and the advantage of this, I guess, is that it allows for an open exchange with the members. We also try to align our own work programme to uh, an extent with the work of the Committee on Budgetary Oversight so that we can help them in, in their work. So obviously, as you'll be aware and as you've heard from, from, from Sebastian, the Fiscal Council originates in the economic and fiscal crisis of the 2008-2012 period and the need for an independent check on the government's fiscal plans. And the, the EU fiscal rules, they, they require that an independent national institution should either complete or verify the government's economic forecasts and check compliance with the EU's fiscal rules. And, you know, you've heard a lot of detail about how the Council does that work. Now, as, as you, you've heard also, the Council doesn't directly work with the Oireachtas, but it does have regular engagement and uh, in particular meeting the, the Budgetary Oversight Committee on its fiscal assessment reports. And this is important in a couple of ways. I suppose first, it allows the Council members a public forum to explain their uh, assessment and the thinking behind it. And it also allows uh, DAL members to get a greater understanding of the issues by asking questions and engaging in an open dialogue with informed independent experts on overall government budget policy. Uh, I just want to, to mention also that the, the PBO and the, the Fiscal Council so have recently agreed a letter of memorandum, letter of understanding between us to share information in areas of mutual benefit and uh, to have more regular contact uh, between us. And I suppose, you know, uh, what we're hoping is that this will help us to avoid uh, any overlap and duplication in our work. So I thought it might be me useful to just give you a little bit of a sense of some of the practicalities and the challenges that arise in, in relation to setting up a new uh, independent fiscal institution. So obviously, you know, I guess it's very important that, that a body such as the PBO be independent, and that's a very important, a fundamental principle for us. And, you know, the, the OECD uh, it does advise that, that PBOs should be non-partisan and independent in their analysis and underpinned by statutory legislation to give this effect. So I, I suppose this is important because it does allow uh, independent institutions to operate in an area that's always going to be politically contentious. Having access to skilled and expert staff is a prerequisite for such a body. And, you know, I'll be honest and say this is a, an, an, it, this has caused us some issues in relation to retaining staff over the last few years. And, you know, we've had a high turnover of our junior staff because many have left us 
on promotion, which is good for them. But uh, it just means that we have had uh, difficulties then replacing them and, you know, trying to recruit the specialist staff. It's, it's a slow process. And I suppose the reality is that individuals that have the economic and statistical skill set that we need and the knowledge of, of the budget process itself, it's, it's just not in plentiful supply and it is in demand, in high demand across civil service bodies generally. I'd also just mention that having a statutory right to access and request government information is really important. Now, our legislation, it does give me, uh, as the director, the right to request information from government ministers and bodies. And it says that I should ha will have all such powers as are necessary or expedient for the performance of my functions. So, you know, cooperation with government departments with requests for information has overall been, been quite good. There have been instances where requests have been ignored or refused or informal consultation before a request was made uh, indicated that no information was, would be provided for us. Now, overall, this hasn't really impeded our work and we can and do use our publications to highlight poor information or lack of information and lack of cooperation. But I suppose it would be this, um, I suppose, soft, soft uh, authority that we have to, to request information would be of greater concern if our remit in relation to costings proposals is, is to be expanded. And in last year's programme for government, the new Irish government made a commitment to explore extending the PBO's mandate to cost political par uh, party election manifestos. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, currently, the government civil service does provide costings of, of political party budget and election proposals. But there are gaps in that because not everything is costed and there's no in independent check on those costings. However, uh, implementing this uh, programme for government commitment would, would require substantial extra resources for the PBO and, uh, you know, also a closer working relationship between ourselves, government departments and potentially other institutions. It would also uh, require a change in the PBO's legislative mandate. Mm -hmm. Although that said, I suppose, you know, it's probably fair to say that this kind of work is probably more suited to a parliamentary budget office rather than a fiscal council because we have uh, closer interactions and engagement with the political system. I suppose I would also you know, suggest that it could potentially dilute the focus of the, the Fiscal Council's own mandate. So look, I didn't want to, to take up too much time in relation to those uh, opening remarks, but just uh, to, to say thanks again for the invitation, and I'm happy to to address any questions that, that you, you might, might have. And obviously Barry is here as well to, uh, to supplement or, or respond to any of the questions as well. Thank you. And uh, what's your relationship with the committee chairs and also with the committees? Yeah, that's a, a good question. I suppose, look, as I've said, our closest working relationship is really with the, the committee on budget oversight and with the chair of that committee. I suppose more broadly, um, what we have been doing over the last while is, I suppose, building on and developing relationships with other committees, the sectoral committees especially, in relation to their their role uh, on approving the uh, the estimates mm -hmm. and in relation to monitoring the spending allocations in year. And over the past uh, couple of years, I suppose we've all been working towards, and with the committee secretariat, working towards improving that in-year monitoring of, of spending by government departments. So I suppose that's, that's allowed us to start to develop closer relationships with, with other committees, 
But this, I suppose, you know, look, fair to say it's a, it's a slow enough process. And uh, I, I, just in relation to how our system works, like while I, I do uh, I do send correspondence to to uh, committee chairs. It's very much up to the the committees themselves to invite us to meet them and and to address them. And you know, some have, but uh, but but not all committees. But this is something that we are working on. Yeah. One of the things we would like to see is a common framework that's used across all the committees, so that we're all reporting against the same issues and also to encourage the uh, departments to report on similar sort of lines and bearing in mind you know the sort of the estimates process seems to uh, drag out and we're always sort of well behind the park curve when we do it have you been able to get uh, an understanding amongst the committees about working to a common framework so that your work is you know, when you're being able to do your analysis everybody can understand it because they're all uh, sharing off the same information sets not necessarily the same information pieces, but obviously all the information has been presented in a way that's readily understandable. And as you build up that experience with the Oireachtas, with the sort of elected members, they get to understand the process as well. Well, actually, that's a very timely question because the Committee on Budget Oversight, um, in the, the newly formed committee uh, for last year, uh, did a review of how how the committee had operated in the previous doll, which was essentially the first committee. So the first committee was set up in 2016. And that that committee made a, a series of recommendations and, and their report was, was just published actually very recently and happy to, to share that with you. Yeah, yes, please. So, so what the committee secretariat and ourselves have been doing since that report was was published is we've now been working on how best to implement those recommendations and they have made a number of recommendations around you know the approval of the estimates you know i think share share your experience it can be a very long drawn out process here in some instances um, some of the estimates aren't approved until halfway through the year uh, so most you know half of the spending has already occurred so there are recommendations around shortening that time frame around having more uh, meetings throughout the year to look at spending in year and so on so that is something then that the PBO is going to be looking at preparing those kinds of templates, which I, I guess is the sort of um, templates that you're talking about, where we would be suggesting to committees, these are the kind of issues that we think that you should be looking at as a committee through the year, and these are the kind of questions we think you should be asking and how you should focus it on. Now, I should also say that one of the, um, obviously, you know, government spending is a, is a, a big element of, of the budget. So over the past couple of years, uh, the PBO has been producing monthly analysis on uh, government spending and also on, on the performance on, on the revenue side as well. So we've been sending that that those assessments and that analysis to committees to help them in their work and in that analysis we we point out i suppose you know the trends uh, where uh, uh, there are areas of overspends occurring and again you know for the committee to focus in on in their engagement with the departments so this is something that we really have been uh, working on over the last couple of years but it's uh, it's something that we'll be i suppose you know trying to come up with a, a more robust framework in future working with the the committee on budget oversight and uh, just a final one for me uh, I mean, to be able to produce monthly uh, outruns, and you need to have a, a degree of understanding of the of the data that's being presented. I mean, how difficult is it to get that? Because you know, we, one of our biggest problems is you know we're months behind here, and you know we're we spend you know we we'd be lucky if we we're getting the current quarter's information sort of a quarter behind. So how how do you manage to do the monthly bit? 
Well, the, the Department of Finance publishes its own monthly fiscal monitor. So that, that monitor has, you know, up to date, real time, monthly figures on the revenue, on the tax take and on the level of spending by each department uh, at vote level. Now, the, on the spending side, it, there's very, there's actually, there's no information published other than the figures. So what we have done is we've been contacting departments directly to get uh, more granular information from them about the spending. You know, so we've been asking them for explanations of, you know, exactly what programs are, are uh, you know, are overspending or underspending and to actually have a program by program level breakdown because that's not being published by the department. And this goes back to, I suppose, you know, the issues around access to information. Uh, I, I think at this stage we get we get very good cooperation from six to seven departments and you know very little information from from the others so you know it's a challenge for us um, but I mean what I would say is that uh, the departments themselves we know the departments have the information mm -hmm. so what we've been trying to do is to just get them to share the information with us to provide the Oireachtas members because of the fact that, and this is something we've been trying to reinforce with the members and I suppose with the government side that, you know, look, it's a, it's a really important role that the, the members have is to approve those estimates. So they really should have as much information as is possible to allow them to, to scrutinize where the, the money is being spent and how well the money is being spent. It's it's but it is it is a work in progress, you know. I, I, I would say that to you. Okay, thanks, Annette. Felicia. I was a fighter over leg, Annette. I was Barry. I can bring you to the show. He's very welcome to this meeting this afternoon. Uh, Annette, just listen to your presentation and that there as well too. Um, is your role uh, very much educational uh, in respect of, say, the elected members and so on? Um, look, I suppose a couple of things I'd say about about it. And I mean, this is the PBO. We're we're up and running now for nearly four years, so it's kind of it's been a learning experience for us as well as the members. And you know, as the members are time poor. We know that uh, a lot of demands on their time and, and resources and, and the budget process, it's complicated, it's technical. You know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. I mean, this year, you know, the government plans to spend around up to 87 billion. So, you know, it's a very large budget. Wow. The tax system is very, very complicated. So, you know, I think we're very conscious that when we're doing our analysis, you know, that we try to explain it as simply as we can and try to explain, you know, the what is very te technical in, in, as I say, in a, you know, as, as a most straightforward way as we can to try to, you know, help, help, help members, you know, to, to understand it because, you know, you're, you're right. It, you know, it, it's about understanding what's going on and you know I suppose the reality is that a lot of the material that's presented by the government side it's very complicated you know yeah. far too complicated detailed I can appreciate that um, uh, and just in the same context then in relation to the fiscal council and so on um, do you find that there's a lot of duplication there, or is it cooperation to such an extent that whereby uh, there isn't duplication? Uh, and can the members themselves see uh, the difference in, in the roles of the PBO and the Fiscal Council? Yeah, look, from, from the outset, we've been really clear and really careful to avoid 
any kind of overlap or duplication with what the council does and we 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 have an informal relationship with them and you know from time to time certainly in the beginning when we were set up we were being asked to look at some issues that were absolutely for the council so we would say that to members no this is not for us this for the fiscal council you know and we'd suggest that they should contact the council about things but you know i mean we see our, our role very much as you know just working within within parliament itself and working on the budget process whereas ifac has a much i suppose it, it's a much broader economic mandate that than we have so i, I don't think that there's confusion about our two roles but it's absolutely something that we're we're very, I suppose, keen to make sure that there isn't an overlap or a confusion about what we do. Yeah. And how best do you describe uh, your role in terms of uh, adding value to the whole process of budgeting? Yeah, well, look, I suppose um, it, it's really to help members to understand the nuts and bolts of it. And, you know, I suppose the, the hope is that there will be better scrutiny of what, what the government is doing in relation to fiscal policy so that members can ask more, I suppose, more pertinent questions, you know, and can really, you know, have, have a better engagement and more evidence-based conversations and discussions with, with the government side in relation to what's happening around the economy and around the budget. So that's very much, I suppose, our, our intention in terms of what it is where we're trying to, where we see we're trying to add value for our members. And do you often find that in bringing forward, we'll say, your information that you're in conflict with say, their uh, government or government departments? Yeah. Yes, and I mean, I, I guess, you know, we have to just acknowledge that up front, you know, that this is a contentious space. So, yeah. but I mean, I think it's very important, though, as well, like we have to be impartial and we have to be objective. So, you know, if there are, if there are things that we feel need to be highlighted for members, then absolutely we, we, we do that, you know, and so we call out things in relation to, uh, to what departments are doing. Yeah, we, you know, that regularly happens. It's your job. Good morning, yeah. Ms. Avarisha. And then, thank you ever so much once again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks, uh, Annette and Barry, for coming and giving us evidence. Um, uh, you concluded or just published recently a, uh, a letter of understanding or a memorandum of understanding with the Fiscal Council. Um, can I, is there is your is your relationship with them uh, based on I mean, a shared view of um, uh, the role of kind of independent fiscal institutions, or is do you, so the context in which I ask that is that the OECD have a checklist of things for successful independent fiscal institutions? Mm -hmm. Are you both? subscribe to the same broad view, although you have different roles and different reporting lines? Yes, yeah, absolutely. You know, that's, that's very much where we're coming from in relation to the relationship that we have with the Fiscal Council. And uh, we're, we're both members of the OECD network of independent fiscal institutions. And in fact, next year, we're going to be hosting a meeting, we'll, we'll jointly be hosting a meeting of that network in, in Dublin. So, uh, you know, from the, from the outset, as I've said, we, you know, we've been careful to, to develop um, an informal work and relationship with the council. I suppose it's, it's, it's based on, you know, um, I suppose informal relationships and, you know, the economics community is, in, is a very small one, you know, so, uh, you know, we, we would have some personal relationships between some of the, the staff in, in our office and, and in the council. And, uh, you know, so that's been helpful. And the, uh, the OECD in the report that they did on the Fiscal Council, they suggested that 
that informal relationship, uh, it would be useful if it was set out in, in a letter of understanding between, between ourselves. So, so that's what we've done and that's why we recently agreed that letter between us. And, you know, as I, I, I said earlier on, I don't think it's, it's because there's a confusion between our roles. But I suppose it's just to give clarity and, you know, to, I suppose, to make it more, more formal and to, to give public clarity to, to, you know, to the fact that this is how we operate and that we have, have a, a close uh, understanding and, and uh, uh, work in relationship. In terms of um, being set out in statute, um, uh, PB was set up in 2015, but not established until uh, not established in statute until an amending act, um, the House of the Oireachtas Commission Amendment Act 2018. Is it? Am I correct in saying that it w was it intended that it would event when it was set up in 15? Was it intended that it would eventually be established in statute, or were you established in statute as a result of practice revealing to people that this needed stat statutory basis? Um, I suppose it's a it's kind of a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. When the OECD uh, made its recommendations in 2015, you know they, that those recommendations clearly said that you know each IFI uh, needs to take account of its own national uh, situation, but strongly suggested that they should uh, conform to the OECD principles. And one of those principles is that uh, PBOs should have a statutory mandate. And I suppose, look, this is based on experience where some, some uh, PBOs uh, had been stripped of resources when they, they issued analysis that was contrary to and critical of, of the government's stance. So it's partly, I, I guess, to insulate the office from, from you know, potential threat from the government side. And the office, we were, we were set up on an administrative basis in, in 2017 when, when I was appointed as director. And it was always the intention that we would prepare legislation. And it's just the way, the way that the the Oireachtas uh, services set up and, and the houses of the Oireachtas. Uh, we receive, we get a three year, a month, uh, multi-annual budget from, from the, the government. And that budget requires uh, a piece of legislation to be enacted every three years. And that's the House of the, the Commission Act. So, it just the way the cycle worked, uh, the, that act was due to be amended anyway in 2018. So we took the opportunity to include establishing the PBO at that time when, when that legislation was, was being enacted. Now, I suppose another quirk is that that has to be agreed with the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform. So it was actually that minister had to bring that legislation into the House. Uh, but it was, you know, I suppose, you know, legislation that we had 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 worked and developed ourselves and worked closely then with the government side in relation to the the, the provisions in the, in the legislation. It doesn't, um, unless I'm misreading it. So it's clause five of that uh, act in 2018. It doesn't really specify an obligation on the part of government departments to provide you with information yes would you like would you like to see mm. that mm -hmm. improved by further legislation uh, absolutely and i mean you know we we before before we we prepared that that legislation and i suppose our business case to have had the legislation enacted we did a lot of research into other uh, pbos internationally and you know, all the evidence suggested on our even in, you know, conversations and consultations with them that this is a really big issue for for pretty well every independent fiscal institution internationally is having access to data and information and you know trying to have as I suppose as robust a piece of, of legislation as is 
as is possible. So I suppose we, from our perspective, we see this as sort of like a, an, an opening gambit where we've gone for a soft, soft approach where I have, I have the right to ask for the information, but you're absolutely right. There's no obligation on, on anybody to actually provide that information. So ideally, yeah, I would love to see that strengthened. But again, just speaking to, to colleagues in other PBOs, in some instances, even where they have, where, where that obligation exists, doesn't ne often necessarily mean that they get the information that they need. You know, so I suppose this is, this is why you know, we've, we've been trying to develop relationships with, with the various departments to try to you know, build up the relationship with them so that we can get access to the information that we need. But I suppose, uh, you know, just to say that one of the um, one of the issues and one of the areas that we've been working on is to develop some of our own models, where you know we can, uh, I suppose, we can have a, you know, an independent um, assessment of mm -hmm. of information and material that we get from departments. Now, this is. You know, it takes time to do this and a lot of expertise to develop these, uh, you know, various different economic models. Mm. But it is something that we are working on. OK, I was going to actually come on to that in a second. But um, the, the question of um, your models, but on the um, point about um, legislation, you know, legislation and, and requirement on departments to share information, um, you can, what is the, what's the, can you give us a, a worst case uh, example of how uh, when the department has refused to give you information, you can obviously anonymise the culprit or culprits. Yeah, well, there have been instances where I guess it's not it's not that we've asked for direct. Well, actually, no, we have we have asked for direct information, and <laughs> you know, the uh, response has been that you're an independent office. And we don't think that it would be appropriate for us to engage in this with you. Okay, uh, that's inter that's really so, useful. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Independent office of their office. Two, two, two brief questions. One, what is, um, and I can't completely see it in the legislation, but it says provide the House of the Oireachtas or an Oireachtas committee fiscal and economic information. Does that mean that an individual TD or senator cannot approach you and ask for a piece of work to be done? It has to be. Um, it has to be a committee, basically, or it has to be the House voting and you know either either House voting in, in a plenary to request information. So um, the the average backbench TD can't simply commission a piece of work from you. Um, in theoretically, no, but we do. We we have a, a parliamentary research service who uh, do accept and and respond to um, you know. Yeah information requests on, on, you know, do research on demand. But I suppose in, in practice, look, if, if a member comes to us with, with a, a query, you know, we, we, we do our best to try to respond to those members and to help them as best we can, you know, based, I suppose, on, our, on the level of resources that we have and, you know, other other priority areas that we have but in general it is most most of the the work is is based on you know direct requests from from budget oversight committee in particular but other other committees as well and That's you know we we make it clear to the to all of the committees that we're more than happy to engage with them you know and and to to work with them and uh, deal with any requests that they have. But that sounds like what you're saying, if it's an individual member, if it, the Parliamentary Research Service is obviously separate to yourselves, although maybe you work together, yes. is it, it's, it's that yes. if they come and ask for a bit of information on desk research that can be got by your people, you, I presume if, they, if a backbencher came up and said, I've got this great policy to, do X, to spend on X, Y, and Z, can you cost it for me? It would be a no. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, what, what we are doing, uh, we have been doing a confidential c costings service for, but it is for political parties and groups okay. rather than from members. 
But I mean, generally speaking, you know, all of the members are are members of a, of a group. Okay. You know, so it is open to them to to request information from us through their group or through their party. And then final question, how important is it that you have, you're talking about basically the fact that you're constructing your own models. How important is mm. it to have, is, does that, I mean, how important is it to have proper um, internal model building and forecasting capacity uh, in your organization rather than just the capacity to kind of scrutinize what you've been given? Yeah, look, I suppose this is where I, I suppose we feel that we can really add value is if we have our own models that we can, I, I suppose, even double check the, the information and, and the costings and so on that are being provided for, from the government side. So this is something that we have develop, been developing and working on, I suppose, you know, primarily on the uh, in relation to you know social welfare payments and labor market models and so on so we we have been we've been developing some of those ourselves and obviously um you know the the economists in in the office have a lot of expertise in this area and uh, would also you know be uh, they have recently developed a debt sustainability model. You know, so this is something that we are that we are working on on and on, on building up that that expertise. Now, some of it uh, we can we can do our, ourselves, but you know, this is where I guess it's it's the relationship with departments and and the level and access to. Uh, information and data that we can get. I mean, you know, primarily a lot of a lot of the models is, is obviously based on publicly available data sets. So uh, you know, that's that's I suppose a slight constraint in terms of 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 uh, building and developing our own models. Uh, but we have we've uh, I suppose a, a particular relationship with the. Uh, Eco Economic and Social Research Institute, mm -hmm. and we have access to their switch model, which is the you know the models, the tax and uh, and social income supports uh, benefit system. So that gives us access to that to that model, and that allows us uh, you know the capacity to to run things through that model also. You know, and that that's an important double check. We also have uh, have access to uh, to other you know, to the Euromod, which is a, a, a European wide version of that switch model. But this it it's it takes time to to develop these models, and as I said, it, it takes uh, technical expertise. So it it will take us some time before we we're we're fully satisfied with with the models and with our own modeling capacity in house. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much, Eddie. Thank you. Thanks. Is that it, Tim? Yep. All good. Annette Barry, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Um, as we progress along our our path. Uh, we would like to sort of keep open the dialogue and the rest of it. So we'd be delighted if you could keep in contact with us. And we'll inform you of our Absolutely. progress. And uh, we'd be delighted if, uh, when things go back to normal, we get an opportunity when we're next down your neck of the woods to come and say thank you very much indeed in person. Uh, to be honest, I prefer doing it in the uh, Doyle itself rather than uh, one of my least favourite buildings in Dublin, where you're stuck at the moment. <laughs> but, uh, yes, well. no, but, uh, <laughs> but we look forward to that. And thank both of you for very Absolutely. much indeed for your time. Yeah, thank you very much again, and happy to, to stay in touch. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Best of luck. Okay, Cheers. thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephen, can we bring keep all the members in the spotlight for the rest of the meeting, please? Thanks. Okay, next item on the agenda: sort of subordinate legislation SL1 on rates in the social housing sector. Uh, the Department of Finance proposes to make a statutory rule under powers conferred by Article 23A. Of the rates Northern Ireland order in 1977. Information on the proposed rules on page 100 to 104. 
The Rates Social Sector Value Regulations Northern Ireland 2007 allows the Department discretion to allow properties owned by the Northern Ireland Housing Executive or Housing Associations to be charged rates on the basis of a social sector value relating to the rent payable rather than on the basis of the property's actual rateable capital value. This permits the Department to ensure that similar properties in the social housing sector have the same rates liability regardless of their location and is said to be consistent with the way in which rent is already calculated in the sector. The Department contends that the total amount of money collected is the same as it would have been if rates had been charged on the basis of the assessed individual capital values in the valuation list. The proposed rule provides a revision to the relevant schedule to reflect name changes etc. Among the housing associations, e.g. Fold and Helm, seem to have become partner organisations to Radius etc. This proposed rule has been devised following consultation with the housing associations. The Department indicates there are no financial implications and this is purely a technical amendment. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution procedure and is to come into effect by the 30th of June 2021. If members are content, mm. is, okay. it, is, is the committee content then has no objection to the rated policy, then it's also content for the Department to make the same make the same rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Great. Moving on to the next item, the agenda number nine, subordinate legislation, statutory rule, whole of government accounts. Uh, the, the Department has made a statutory rule under powers conferred by Section 15.1 of the Government Resources and Accounting Act, Northern Ireland, 2001. Relevant papers are at page 106 to 115. The rule will enable the Department of Finance to request information from those departments and bodies designated in the schedule to the order and to pass the information provided to HM Treasury for use in the preparation of the whole of government accounts. This is an ongoing UK-wide exercise, which Northern Ireland has been part of since 2004 and 5. The rule adds the Forestry Service and the Commissioner for, Services for, Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Abuse to the designated bodies. The committee agreed that it was content with the re related SL1 on the 20th of April 2021. The Department advises that the statutory rule does not deviate from the original SL1. The rule is subject to negative resolution assembly procedures to come into effect on the 1st of June 21. Members content. Now, therefore, uh, the Committee for Finance has considered the proposed statutory rule, statutory rule 2021-120, the whole of government accounts, designation of bodies, order Northern Ireland 2021, and subject to the report of the examiner, statutory rules have no objection to this rule. Is this agreed? Agreed. It's agreed, but can I say for the record, Chair, I'm slightly bemused as to the... I know the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Abuse is a relatively new... Forestry Service, yeah. The, I'm slightly bemused to the idea the Forestry Service was not... Um, consolidated the whole of government accounts before now. It seems very odd mm. to me. Do you wish to write to the department and ask? I, 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 think it's I think it's a question worth asking. I'm just yes. intrigued by the Forest Service. Is not, as far as I'm aware, it's not a new, it's not a new organisation. It's, I think it, it might be worth... I think we write to the department and ask them, are there any other of the... Uh, as well as the Forestry Service, were there any other? Yeah, I mean, the whole government accounts is an interesting one because it's a sort of interesting accounting device the UK government uses to try and consolidate the every, you know, the accounts of every single UK public body, even in devolved and otherwise. But it just seems all, and, and including local government, it seems odd to me that the Forest Service was not consolidated before. Let me wrap it up slightly large and ask, uh, having noted the fact that the Forestry Service um, uh, seems to be a, a, uh, an arm's length body that should have been... Um, are there any others? Yeah, are there any others? Okay. Uh, or, 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 sorry. Are they, sorry, are they confident that all other? Yeah. Could all somebody make the words because my mouth is still half asleep? Uh, but Including something on the lines that all arms length bodies are now reporting in yeah. accordance with whatever. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, moving on to item ten on the agenda: correspondence, correspondence index. Members asked about the index of the eleven received items of correspondence. On page one one seven. Uh, the Workforce Review, Northern Ireland members are asked to consider a copy of the latest Workforce Review uh, led in the Assembly of the Department on 10th of May 2021. The review considers NICS employment and recruitment in terms of religious and gender, identifies unfair participation in, unfair part participation in a number of N NICS categories by religion and gender. The review is dated 20th June 2020, so it appeared to have been with the Department for almost a year. Now, the, mythology for, the, the methodology for identifying. I've got it right the first time. Yeah. The mythology. 
Uh, Jim, I've had dental work today. I'm, 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 I, I, do you know what? I'm about to hand this over to the vice chair in a second because I am, I am a real difficulty. This may, this may well be his last day here, Mr. Yeah. Chairman, before he becomes first what? minister. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Right, I shall try. I shall try again, and I apologise for mumbling, but it's, okay. it's painful. The mythology, for, oh, the, <laughs> the methodology for identifying unfair participation in the NICS appears to be based on deviations in respect of religion or gender of more than five percent for similar categories in the 2011 census, in terms of either employment or applications for employment. Under the methodology, unfairness can be addressed by having an appropriate applicant pool. Thus, at EO1 and EO2 grades in the NI Civil Service, 53% of employees are Roman Catholic, and this exceeds by more than 5% of the equivalent group in the 2011 census. However, as 53% of the applicants for these posts are Protestant, the report indicates there is a fair participation. At Deputy Principal level in the NICS, 51.5% are Protestants, which is fairly close to the 2011 census expectation. However, as 53 to 56% of the applicants for promotions were Roman Catholics, the report indicates there is not fair participation for Protestants because it's outside the five percentage five percentage mark. The corrective actions in respect of the above appear to be limited to welcomes to limited to welcome statements for underrepresented groups in recruitment. Are members content to write to the department and seek information on the impact of the recent large scale deputy principal, staff officer, administration office recru recruitment in respect of the makeup of NICS staff? Are we agreed? Agreed. Mm -hmm. uh, department for Finance Building Fire Safety Programme Members are asked to note a response from the Department regarding the Building Fire Safety Programme. The Department clarifies that its previous reference to urgency was meant in terms of the Westminster Bill and the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government request for clarity on the Northern Ireland rollout of measures. It now advises that the relevant measures won't apply in this jurisdiction and the Department's responsibility will bring forward local measures. Hmm. So basically, it's urgent in England and Wales, but it's not urgent here. Is, is that how I read that? I think the urgency, Chair, was that the uh, legislation was being brought forward. Quite a lot of it is reserved, but it would apply in Northern Ireland. So there was an urgent requirement for the department to, relevant departments to advise how these measures were going to be rolled out. Now, they're not going to be rolled out in Northern Ireland, they're just going to apply in some of the rest of the UK. So the way that Northern Ireland is going to deal with it is the interim hawks is leading a, a cross-departmental group, which is going to identify the departments with the responsibilities and we will come up with our own measures. So the urgency wasn't, I think I'd read it as safety, there was an urgency around safety, but no, they clarify the urgency was about legislation which was about to apply and uh, they weren't quite clear how that was to be ruled out. So just for my clarity in my, my own head, it's that we've recognised there is a significant problem with building fire safety programme, that in the rest of the UK, well I think it's in England and Wales, I don't know what's happening in Scotland, mm -hmm. England and Wales, they have identified this as a problem and they want to deal with this fairly quickly because of some of the implications that come from the, I imagine from the Grenfell mm -hmm. fire. Yeah, we're saying that we'll give it to an interim head of civil service and there isn't as great of urgency to deal with it. Whereas, despite we've had evidence here in the committee that shows that uh, this is as equally as important in Northern Ireland as, as in the rest of the UK. Am I, I'm sorry, somebody correct me if I'm misrepresenting that, but that's, that's, uh, I'm not very happy with that response from the department. So right back to the department? Yes, I think we'll right back to the department. I I'm think are we content to say that, members? Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, great, thank you. That's okay, Paul. You're not going to be the Minister of Finance, so you'll be all right. Uh, next, next. Can you see the pain in his face? He can't the Minister of Finance. <laughs> if we move on to the next item of the agenda, uh, Rockpool Limited banning combustible materials. Members are asked to consider at page 278 correspondence from Rockpool Limited providing an update on its position on the call for a ban on combustible materials in buildings in Northern Ireland. Rockwell calls for a fire safety audit of all buildings over 11 metres. Rockwell also refers to an NIHE tower block action plan published in 2018 and an indicative redevelopment action plan to address five fire safety issues over the next five years. 
Ask members are we content to forward the correspondence to the Department and seek clarification as to whether the capital budget for 2021-22 and beyond will include funding for the NIHE Tower Block Action Plan. Copying this correspondence to the committee, the committee for the communities. I think that's quite important. Are we agreed? Agreed. Uh, Department for Finance, uh, UK Internal Market Act briefing. Um, members are asked to consider at page 287 a response from the Department on the Assembly Research Paper on the UK Internal Mar Market Act. Department provides limited responses on state aid and indicates limited consideration has been given to the term special regard in the Act. Department indicates that it believes that the duty in section 46 of the UK internal market cannot override another express duty. Hmm. Are members content to share the response with the Committee for the Executive Office and the Committee for the Economy and to await further responses from the Executive Office and the Department for the Economy? Agreed. Agreed. Matthew, you want to say anything about that? Yeah, agreed. Sure. Um, ten point six. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, item ten point six. Department of Finance, section forty six of the UK Internal Market Act. Members are asked to consider at page two nine three a response from the department indicating that it has not considered measures etc. in order to ensure compliance with both section forty six of the Internal Market Act and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Are we content to note? Note it. Department of Response Final Budget 2122. Members are asked to note at page 295 a departmental response regarding the final budget for 2122, setting out the resource baseline as 11.9 billion. We are aware of that. Allocations to Northern Ireland Water 168 million plus 233 million in capital. Yes. And TransLink approximately 280 million resource and 350 million in capital. A breakdown of the Job Start scheme and the shortfall in EU funding. And the 2016 delegated spending limits for Northern Ireland departments, which are being reviewed. Are we content to note, bearing in mind the briefings we're we'll getting over the next couple of weeks? Yep. Content. Can I ask, use that opportunity to ask, Chair, if um, you will be speaking on, the, on behalf of the committee next week in the debate that we're due to have on the budget statement? Next week? Or, or, or am I wrong that we're. That's the following week. Or the following, is it the following week? <laughs> yes. The following week. <laughs> I hope so. Right. Yeah, I think the uh, supply resolution should be on the 7th and the yeah. second yeah. stage of the budget bill on the 8th. Yeah. yeah. On this, <laughs> the member seen an order paper. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. I, I'll, okay, I'll, I'm, I'm, have, I'm have, 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 have a look. definitely wrong, so that's fine. No, no. <laughs> Matthew, <laughs> I, I, I you almost, are most definitely out. If you've read it somewhere, have a quick look at it. While we're going on, you just have a quick okay. look at that and let us know where you're on that. Uh, ministerial Correspondence Budget No. 2 Bill. Members are asked to note at page 346 Ministerial Correspondence seeking accelerated passage for Budget No. 2 Bill, uh, NI 2021. Department is expected to brief on the 26th of May. Uh, Assembly Research will provide further background on the 2nd of June. The Department will return on the 2nd of June to respond to committee queries. Members will then be asked to set out the position in respect of the accelerated passage on the 7th of, or 2nd of June. And the supply resolution debates and the second stages of debates are expected on the 7th and 8th of June, respectively. So I think it's the timing. Yeah. Yeah. Members are uh, content to note the correspondence uh, in anticipation of the departmental briefings. Great. Uh, departmental response on the Presbyterian Mutual Society. Members are asked to note on page 348 a response from the department regarding the Presbyterian Mutual Society, which is essentially identical to the response from the Department for the Economy received by the committee previously. It does not provide the number of it does not provide the number of savers affected and neglects to explain why the committee has not been kept informed. Jim, would you like to say anything? Why, why the secrecy? Well, what's what's the problem here? I mean, this is two hundred billion pounds worth of taxpayers' money that was made available in the form of a loan to save what is a very difficult situation. And I can understand why there's reluctance to be utterly transparent about what has happened. And I don't think we should let go on this point. Mm -hmm. I think, we should, uh, I think I would be content uh, with the committee's approval to write back to the department again and ask for those details. We're not asking for specific names, no, no, no. but what we're specific, we want to be able to get a sort of a sense of why the circumstances have prevailed, and we need to have that information. Are we content to write to the department to do that? Great. Uh, next item on the agenda: audit committee estimates for Northern Ireland Audit Office and NIPSO. Uh, members are asked to note at page 353 correspondence from the Audit Committee that provides a link to the report of the estimates of the Northern Ireland Audit Office and the, sorry, the Northern Ireland Public Service Ombudsman 2122, assent to the Department. 
the clerk has reviewed the report, the report. The audit committee doesn't draw any matters to the committee's attention. Are we content to note? Okay. Yep. Okay. Uh, correspondence from Mid and East Antrim Borough Council on a free port at Larne. Oh. Members are asked to consider at page 354 correspondence from Mid and East Antrim Borough Council indicating its support for the development of a free port at Larne with supporting facilities in Ballymena. The Council appears to be asking the Committee to progress discussions with HM Treasury in this regard. Are members content to report to the Council indicating that although members support the argument for greater development in Northern Ireland ports, the Committee is not in a position to engage with HM Treasury in this regard? And I also understand the Economy uh, Committee are looking at issues of free ports as well. Uh, I don't know, but I, mean, I, I, I would be cautious. I'm not sure we, we, we say that the, the Committee endorses the Free ports in every um, indicating broad support for Larn developing its for Larn support is fine. Um, I'm not sure we'd want to indicate uh, specific support for this campaign. And I would further add, um, and I'm happy to con concede there's a degree of say political point that Ms. Donnelly, the chief executive of this council, is a very enthusiastic correspondent with public bodies, and I uh, would be very cautious about us being co-opted into a. Um, into a, a, a campaign. So leave it at that. Okay. Uh, first of all, I might need to make a declaration of interest. I actually live in uh, the, uh, the, cons the, the, the borough of Mid and East Antrim Borough Council by the sum total of about 20 metres. I've slipped out of Antrim and Newton Abbey Borough for that degree, the rest of it, so I must declare an interest in this particular point as well. Chair, and, I think, uh, and, and I think, obviously, with the, uh, the, the Deputy Chair and our other Honourable Member from North Antrim, they might like to make some comment. With, with that expose from you, I would have to then also declare an interest in living <laughs> in the East Antrim uh, Borough Council. But is, is there, a, and having uh, given that declaration of interest, um, would it be in order that we had passed this on to the department to ask their views, rather than just ending it? And again, I, I get that we can't uh, interact with the treasury, uh, even if they want, even if we wanted to, they probably would ignore us. But is it is it in order that we maybe send it on to the department, asking for their thoughts and work on the subject, if at all any? Mm. Is uh, mm. Jim still on the? He's not. Philip oh, he's not. Is indicated. Sorry. My, my own view, I take what Paul saying, my own view is that I would be content to, for the letter, for the finance department to note, I would be ca very cautious about us looking like we were advocating uh, the position that is being argued by uh, Mid and East Antrim Council, and that's making no comment on the merits or otherwise of it. Mm. I mean, I'm happy to head on to note, but I also think we should be sending it to. I think this is. It doesn't really sit within the Department of Finance. I think it sits with the Department of Economy, the issues of free ports, and also the Executive Office, because we're also talking about. So this also ties in with um, sort of the wider issues with city deals and some of the other issues yeah, that are there as well. So maybe if we send it to. Um, oh, sorry, Philip. Oh, so I forgot. You're you're also an honourable member from North Antrim in this borough as well. Philip, can you come in there? Uh, well, uh, my points have kind of been covered uh, pretty similar uh, uh, to Matthew's in that I, I wouldn't be expressing support or other ways uh, on the issue. And that's not to say I don't support or other ways the issue. It's just that we haven't took a decision. And so I, I would be kind of a, uh, kind of supportive of noting the correspondence and if, if we felt we needed to forward on to somebody who, who, who who was in a position to deal with it, I would support that as well, but I wouldn't be writing back uh, either supporting or non-supporting the issue. Okay. Uh, I, think, uh, I think just taking the consensus of the group as we send it on to, to we say we've noted it and we've sent it on to Department of Finance, Department of Economy and the TEO for, um, uh, for, their, uh, for their noting and any yeah. comments they may wish to make. Their information. Yeah. 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 Okay. Great. Great. Item uh, 12, a Correspondence Department of Finance Reform of Property Management Programme. Members are asked to consider page 357 of departmental response in respect of the Reform of Property Management Programme and hard charging for departmental services. The departments indicate the following points. Around 26 million of the target, 50, of target 54 million expired leases has been disposed of. The department is in the process of refreshing its investment strategy. I thought we were told last week that they'd already done that. We were told that, apparently, that is not. This is what they have indicated, Chairperson. That was my understanding as well. Well, I, didn't we have evidence to say that they had? 
may have indicated in writing that uh, I think there was maybe they'd conflated the asset management strategy, which is the executives and the department's investment strategy. But uh, in any event, the department's investment strategy is being um, refreshed as we speak. Maybe that's something we'll bring up when we have the either the interim or the new head of the department when he comes or he or she comes before us. And that 60% of the NICS employees wish to work from home most of the time. The department has not responded to questions in respect of unused workstations and hard charging. Uh, therefore, it is likely the HM Treasury will undertake a spending review later this year, which may lead to a reduced block grant. Are members content to write to the department and suggest that it commences preparation now, including consideration of measures likely to reduce departmental costs and drive efficiency? such as rationalisation of unused building space and hard charging for departments. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Uh, members are asked to consider the composite request at page 362. Uh, are the members content the composite request is accurate and complete record of the committee's information request that says this agreed? Are we agreed? Agreed. Yep. We've done agreed. the forward work programme. Uh, nobody's notified. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Matthew. Is there any other business? I was going to come back to the point I raised. We can do it under it. Are we on any other business now? Uh, we're just about to. Okay, I'll let you do it formally then. I was just going to make the point about next week. So I have received on budget statement for next Tuesday, for next Monday, uh, this was in a note, uh, a party note following business committee yesterday, indicating that the finance minister would be making, so it would be a, the debate that we are due to have on the budget statement. So rather than the budget bill, the fulsome debate that we have on the actual budget statement. And that was, if you remember, um, whenever he ma confirmed the final budget position, yeah. uh, which was the end of Mar April, and he said he would be giving a full statement to the Assembly by the end of this month. I think that was, I believe, on the 27th of April, and you yourself and pointed the, out the fact that he wasn't going to do it before the end of the month. So I believe yeah. that we're debating that next week. That's based on what I've heard from the business, what came out of the business committee yesterday. Sorry, is, that a, is that a debate or a statement? It's a debate. Yeah, but well, it's not a statement, Matthew. Sorry, Pat. Sorry, I'm sure. I have a statement. Uh, I, 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 sorry, we'll, Peter, we'll, we'll take, this, take this offline and we'll have a. We'll if, if it is a debate, then I anticipate the chair will. Oh, if it is a debate, it I'll is, obviously yeah, be speaking yeah, about that. Um, yeah. Your information is more up to date. But, uh, yeah, it, it's purely because we, I mean, we presume we'll all be speaking on it, but um, uh, it would be. Um, yeah, okay, I think we can revisit that. I'm slightly concerned about the, um, the notice if, if we're. Um, yeah. Uh, any other any other business? Okay, thanks very much indeed, team. Um, hopefully, we'll all be together reconvening next Wednesday at uh, fourteen hundred here. But if we're if we're not, uh, we wish you all the best. Well, thank you very much, Chair. But can I just say, just since you going back to your uh, point of uh, interest, that you declaration of interest, that, does that mean you vote for me? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it most categorically means I don't. <laughs> and that is a declaration of interest. <laughs> OK, team. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It was nice knowing you, Paul. Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, programme signed. <laughs>